Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to our webinar this evening about the eight technology trends and the eight societal trends that are busy converging and creating opportunities that everyone can partake in. So we are very excited to have Scott back in the hot seat and be sharing all of these trends with us, answering your questions and getting into what has happened and what you can do to take advantage of it. So before we start, um, as you know, I will be in the background answering all the questions. Um, and if I can't answer them, getting Scott to answer them. So please do pop them in the questions or the comment boxes. Um, throughout the webinar and in the meantime let us know where you are joining us from whether it's morning afternoon evening we'd love you to say hi um, and just let us know where you're joining us from so with that i'm going to hand over to scott and we're really this webinar gets a whole lot of questions so please be prepared for a slightly longer than normal webinar we will try and keep it within time but people generally enjoy this topic um, so we will go for as long as you want us to go with your questions and answers. So please just be aware of that. Good evening, Scott. Thank you for being in the hot seat once again. Awesome. Thanks, Lee. Well, yeah, wonderful to be back. I must admit, this is a, this is a webinar I really enjoy doing. Um, it's one of my better webinars and uh, tend to get a bit carried away. So like you say, um, from a length perspective, I've spent more than 20 years studying in this space and uh, watching you know as far back as my undergrad university degree my honors and my masters are all in this topic so it's quite difficult to condense 20 years worth of understanding into less than two hours um, however i'll do it i'll give it my best shot and um but what i wanted to do was that if anyone thought that they were coming along just to kind of um have one-way learning um, i want to try and make tonight interactive so let's get started with a question and this should hopefully get people engaging their brains. So I would like to know what is an ESG? You can just type it into the chat box. So digital platforms, private markets and ESGs, the future of investing is already here. Now, I'm not sure if you know what a digital platform is. I'm not sure if you know what a private market is. But more importantly, I'd like to know if you know what an ESG is. And let's see if we've got any any takers, environmental, social governance, Vishlin. So we've got one, one uh, person, give it a go. ESG, no, no, I presume there's no idea. No dear. <laughs> uh, so it's just interesting. I'm purposely engaging your brain uh, so that people can think about it. And uh, Vishlin, uh, very well done. It is actually um, <clears throat> environmental, societal, and corporate governance, uh, and it's funds and strategies. So very much in line with, uh, with what you said. And um, it's environmentally conscious, uh, sustainable investing. And uh, Basil also, uh, also got it right. So if you knew that one, let's see if you know what this one is. What's a DeFi? So this is up to Vishlin, uh, Vishlin and Basil because they, uh, they either know how to use Google quickly or, uh, <laughs> or knew the answer. And uh, here we've got a few more coming through. Decentralized finance. So lots of people are guessing this one right. Excellent. So yes, it's decentralized finance. And... We're going to talk about these things tonight, so I'll go into them in more detail of what they are. And if you've never heard of them, don't worry about it. Um, what I did want to say is that Lee uh, sent me a task. And if you watched last week's webinar or week before, whatever, you would have seen this, uh, this slide. And it's what's the difference between beginning teaching and advanced learning. And Lee sent me a task and said, Scott, look, I want you to do the eight trends on technology and the eight trends on on society and what's changing and but we want you to start from scratch it must all be new content and uh so you know i sat down last night with the task at i don't know plus minus eight o'clock and um and i started looking through all the thing and what i realized is that the fundamentals don't change you know and 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 so if there's people on this webinar that have attended a webinar similar to this like we call it the eight trends webinar plus minus you know a lot of the fundamentals will be the same 
and that won't change. What does change over time is that obviously the examples of it changes and different areas of, of, of some of the trends um, are adapting and changing, which, which I will keep you updated on. I've, I've done a lot of work uh, to do that. But I did just want to say that, you know, the, again, the difference for me between beginning teaching and advanced learning is the beginning teaching is when you're focusing on theory and advanced learning is when you're actually getting into practice. And so, you know, Jay, you said kindly, yeah, there's changes everywhere and, and we're a reliable source. What, what I've tried to do tonight, if nothing else, is one of the best things I learned from a guy called Roger Hamilton is that, you know, theory is technically that all the little puppies go and eat in a, in a row. And actually, in practice, it's a bit of chaos. And what Roger Hamilton said is that, you know, every single person has knowledge. Like, if you've got access to Google, you've got knowledge. Um, but what people are not looking for anymore, they don't need knowledge. They need direction. And so my purpose tonight is that I've spent, you know, I've got the privilege of being part of many different groups, some of them internal groups, some of them part of our community, some of them external groups. And I'm, I've got the privilege of being part of many of these groups. And, and I'm always gathering information. And so really when Lee sent me the challenge of making sure it was new content, uh, what I did was aggregate all the information that I've collected over the last six months that, that is relevant to this webinar and tried to put it into different areas um, to give direction to the fundamentals. So again, I want to be clear, you're going to hear some, if you've heard this webinar before, you're going to hear some of the same stuff again, um, because the fundamentals don't change. But the practical application, so again, the beginning learning or the advanced, what's it again, the beginning, the beginning teaching or the advanced learning, the advanced learning is, is what tonight's about. It, it's going deeper. It's in the practice. It's this chaos. It's living in COVID and the puppy is eating all over the place. And the fact that I told a story last week when, when I brought an ERP, which is an enterprise resource planning system or a fancy way of saying a technology system across a hundred million pound company nearly 20 years ago. You know, the theory in, at university in my master's, I learned how to do it. But in practice, it was the, the sister of the owner that had to change her dot matrix you know, printer that caused all world of havoc. And, you know, we never learned that in the theory world. And so what we're wanting to do tonight is to, and, and, and today, where, wherever you are, whatever time zone, is to go into that. So I want to share a little video with you. And this video, some of the numbers have, have, have been, you know, need to be updated. But it just gives you a, a bit of an understanding of why we're here and in 60 seconds encapsulates what we're talking about. Oh, where's it gone? Where's my video gone? Uh, two seconds. Just want to check something. Hmm, that is so weird. Okay. Well, I give up. <laughs> Don't know where my videos got. Uh, that's not the case with all my videos. Anyway, let's skip the video. I'll bring it up later. Actually, no, I know how to find you the video quickly. Uh, desktop. We're looking at your calendar at the moment, Scott. Yeah, I don't know. I know you are. I just. On his part of the video. just enjoy that video because it kind of in 60 seconds encapsulates a lot of what we're going to talk about. So let me, uh, let me come back to the slideshow here. And, you know, a lot of people talk about the why. And this is a picture of me and my dad. I was 13 years old. And this was actually my first property project. And uh, what's really interesting is what I learned from my dad was we were taught to go to school, go to university, work hard, get a great job, pay your taxes, invest. 
And unfortunately, my dad passed away uh, broke on the 1st of August, 2005. And what I learned at a very young age is that statistically of the people listening to this webinar, 94% uh, of people in the Western world, so that's England, Australia, or America, will follow my dad. So 94% of you at the age of 65 will either be broke, uh, dead, or reliant on the government. 5% of you, 5% will be trapped. And what that means is you, you'll call yourself financially independent or even trying to be financially independent, but actually you're earning 25% less than your last paycheck and uh, life is very tough and, and you're trapped. And, and ultimately only 1% of people uh, win the race. Every single one of us is trying to run this race uh, and to win. And less than 1% of people are wealthy at the age of 65. And I learned you know, this lesson from my dad that the whole metaphor of go to school, get a good job, you know, go to university, work hard, invest, pay your taxes is like ridiculous because we set up for failure. And so I decided to do it very differently. At a, at a very young age, you know, I had a passion for technology. I, I was programming when I was six years old on a Commodore 64 with a turtle called Logo. You know, I always loved the, the game of Monopoly and I've always loved property. And at a passion or a purpose level, not only from my dad's story, but from growing up in Africa, there were a lot of people that, you know, we witnessed the wealth gap every single day. You know, I sit here in, in, in a beautiful estate and, and yet on the hill, I can actually see a squatter camp. And so, you know, I believe that we're all on this planet for a purpose and, and, and our purpose is to empower that 99% to be able to invest like the top 1%. And here's the, um, the video that I was going to play. The point being is that the right information at the right time is nine tenths of any battle. And so, you know, one of these uh, reasons for doing these webinars is to keep people updated with the information as to what's happening. Now, we've been through a very interesting six months and we all know about the COVID, we all know about the shutdowns. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But the thing I have learned over the last 20 years, and I've been investing since 1999, so 21 years now that I personally have been investing. And the thing I learned uh, actually quite, quite young in life is that um, people always in a crash always focus on the right hand side of this graph. So I was pointing to my slide with my pen. Um, and, uh, and it's this right hand side of the graph that, that you need to, that people focus on. And, and yet actually, it's the left hand side that you need to focus on. It's what's the fundamentals? What are the long term trends? And corrections actually are very good. So, so we've got a webinar with Prof Ferruli in uh, two or three weeks. It's like the 20th of, of October. And he's one of the most respected uh, property economists in the space. And he says that every person will get to experience maybe three or four corrections in their life. Now, if you watch any, if you go and study wealth, everyone will say that the time to create real wealth is in the time of chaos. Like chaos equals opportunity. And you only get two, three, maybe four in your investment career. And therefore, when you look at the right-hand side of the graph, it's all about fear. And when you look at the left-hand side of the graph, it's actually a time of excitement. However, you've got to understand the fundamentals and you've got to understand the long-term trends. If you're trying to invest in Detroit, even though it might look like a discount, it doesn't mean that it won't keep going down the other way. It, you know, it, it, if, you, if the fundamentals are wrong, it, it's still the wrong investment. And then you look at a graph like this that, uh, that we did back in 2015, and I'm purposely using an old graph, an old slide, because what we said when it comes to the internet is that it started with publishing, then it went to social media, then it went to e-commerce, and now you've got social media and e-commerce come together, and it's e-commerce, uh, sorry, it's social commerce. And that's basically about online investing. And we're not quite there yet. You know, people have gone from consuming to participating to transacting and finally to investing. And it'll take time. And I would say that most people were already in the social media stage. Some were starting to venture into e-commerce and very few were in online investing. And then something metamorphic changed and that was COVID. And some of you might have seen this picture before, but you know, before COVID, we've been on Zoom for, I stand to be corrected, but about five years now. And yet most of my mates, this was all my friends from UCT, and, and most of my corporate mates had never even been on Zoom. And, and yet within like two, three months of COVID, Zoom went over 300 million users. Now it had 10 million users before COVID and it had 300 million within like two months. And then companies started having to do virtual AGMs. Now again, this is confusing to me because We've been doing virtual AGM since 2014. 
because we've got investors in, I forget, Lee, how many countries it is. It's, it's a lot, 42 countries or something, shareholders. And, um, you know, so we had to do a virtual AGM. It wasn't whether we wanted to, but suddenly COVID forced people. And so what, what basically happened is that in any adoption, it's not just technology, it's any adoption, you've got the innovators, the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, and then the laggards. And what you can see here is the, is the yellow line is really when you start to hit massive profitability. And so in the beginning, there's not a lot of money to be made. And then you start to in the early majorities when it really starts to grow. And then once you get into this stage, this is when, this is when you get real, real growth. And what's interesting in the beginning is that it's all about pleasure. And so you heard me use this analogy before, but I bought my first cell phone in 1999. And I remember my mom saying it was extravagant. And it might have been extravagant in 1999. And to be honest, I bought it for social. It was fun and I could interact and whatever. It was my first year out of, year out of university. And yet nowadays, if you don't have a cell phone, like you literally don't exist. Like you can't, you can't communicate with the world. And so come, you know, why do people do it? Well, people move four times more away from pain than they do towards pleasure. And that's what COVID's done. It's a societal shift that will not change. It, it's not just going to go back. And, and through that, and you know, tonight there's so much to share and I'm not going to do it all because we're actually running a seven series webinar, but things are changing. You know, the F Google and Facebook, you don't need to go to work anymore at Google and Facebook. And so listings in San Francisco are up 700%. Yes, you heard me right. 700% because people are saying, well, I don't need to live in San Francisco. It costs 11 and a half times more to live in San Francisco than anywhere else in America. So why not go and live somewhere else in America, have a good lifestyle and still work for Google. And then you start looking at it from Google's perspective and they now only don't have to only hire people that live in San Francisco. They can hire the best engineers from anywhere in the world. That's what I mean by the difference between pleasure and pain, because all the companies could, the technology was actually there for us to go out and hire people all over the world and to work on zoom and to work virtually. But yet for so few people were doing it, by the way, we've been doing it for a decade or more. Uh, in fact, since 2005. But what's fascinating is that the pain of COVID has created that structural shift. And what's so interesting is that the last time this happened was in 2008, 2009, when we had the global financial crisis and a little company called Uber suddenly popped up. Now, no one wanted to drive cars. You know, if, if, if I said to Lee, whose son's at university, listen, you know, your son's going to aspire to be a, a car driver you know, she would be like, that's not happening. Okay. But, but if suddenly he comes out of university, can't get a job and he's got a car and he can go and drive part-time or even while he's at university, he can drive part-time and make some extra money. I will virtually guarantee you, mommy will be like, that's, you should be doing that. That's a good thing. You know, and, and suddenly Airbnb comes along and, and people are like, there's no ways I'm going to let a stranger live in my house, but you know, I can't afford my mortgage or I can't afford my rent. And actually I've got a, you know, two, three bedroom place here. Why don't I do this? I can make some extra money. So again, did people make decisions from pleasure or did they make it from pain? And it's really important to understand what I'm saying here because in times of change, the more pain, the more change and the more long, listing, uh, long lasting. And that's really where, you know, what I'm trying to say to you is that you get to choose. You can see this as a time of pain and you can make excuses or you can be resourceful. And in every major crisis that has happened in the, throughout history, 99% of people sit around complaining and they want the status quo to go back to normal. And 1% of people get resourceful. And 10 years from now, everyone looks back and goes, how did they get so lucky? And it's completely different. They weren't lucky. They were being resourceful. They looked at the world in a different way. And that's why this whole series is about the concept of wealth 5.0. We've been talking about this for at least 18 months. And it's now here, whether you like it or not, COVID is it's on your doorstep. It's made it happen. And what's really fascinating is that you can fight it or you can embrace it. <laughs> you get to choose, but it's happening with or without you. So the best metaphor I can give you is it's like a tsunami and you're at the beach and the tsunami is hitting whether you like it or not. So you can either try and like stand on the beach and like stand there all strong and say, I'm going to fight this wave. Or you can like climb a tree and hope that the tsunami is not too big. Or you can climb and run up a mountain and, uh, and try and get to you know, safety. Um, or maybe you get a surfboard and you learn to surf because this wave's coming, whether you like it or not. It's a metaphor, but you need to think about it. And so what is Wealth 5.0 all about? Now, 
I think the webinar is the 4th of November. We've got an entire webinar just about this. So I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. But in simple terms, it's about your impact and your purpose. The number one thing that I believe is going to be part of this next decade is, is it's all about purpose. If you don't have an individual purpose, if you don't have a purpose from a company perspective, you will not be one of the great companies or the great individuals that live a life of legacy. It's about value creation. You know, my son is eight years old and I've, I've taught him. It's not about how to make money. It's about how to add value. You can have anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. Zig Ziglar. So how much value can you add to the world? Thirdly, it's about high touch. How many people can you reach and add and, and, and not only add value, but in a personalized way in a high touch environment? High tech, how do you use technology to do it at scale? And then finally, from a digital perspective, how do you solve global problems? And what's interesting is you've got global problems and you've got individual problems. You've got global problems and then you've got my problem or Lee's problem or any one of you that's online's problems. And that's, that's what we mean by solving problems. So where did we start? Well, we wanted to make global real estate investing easy. And really what we, what we, what we came up with in 2014 was a way for people to invest in the company. A bunch of people came to us and they said, listen, we like investing in the properties, but how do we actually invest in the platform? We call them wealth partners, but they actually are shareholders. And so if you like what you hear tonight, and tonight is all about theory and learning and practical application, is that, um, is that if you like it, at the end, I'm going to give you, and again, it's not for everybody, but I'm going to give you a way to participate to become a shareholder in our company. I'm going to give you a way where you can actually get a discount of our current valuation. And depending, there's different ways, anywhere from 3 to 25%. I'm going to give you a way that you can actually earn a 7 to 10% income. So the one thing that, that I believe in any crash is that there's three things people are looking for. The first is that they want to protect their capital. The second is that they want to earn an income, an actual cash income. And the third is that they want to take advantage of the opportunity. And so we created this, this ability for people to become shareholders, to protect their capital, to earn an income, and to be able to take advantage of the opportunity. And as uh, Wayne Gretzky said, you know, the, the most famous ice hockey player ever, you know, good hockey players are playing to where the puck is. A great hockey player is playing to where it's going to. And the whole essence of tonight is not telling you where the world is today. It's not looking back on where the world's been in the last five or 20 years. It's trying to give you insight into the where the world's going over the next five to 10 years. And so we're going to share with you about a meta marketplace. I think the, the world has changed. You know, Amazon is known today as the everything store. It's the most valuable company in the world. Uh, Jeff Bezos and his wife are two of the wealthiest people in the world. But I don't believe that the next 20 years is going to be about one big behemoth. It's going to be about personalized, targeted niche markets. It doesn't mean the underlying technology can't be the same, but it's going to be about personalization. And I'm going to share with you later around the concept of a meta marketplace where you've got global marketplaces, you've got local marketplaces, you've got real estate, you've got diversification, you've got genres, you've got community. We've got it all within our global wealth group meta marketplace and, and meta is a bigger than one marketplace. So it's multiple marketplaces brought together. And the best metaphor I like to give people is like Independence Day. You've got the mothership and then you've got all the little baby spaceships. And, uh, and you know, for us, we talk about it being the Amazon of personal wealth. You know, so Amazon has, has created this behemoth of a company by providing, you know, a massive amount of value to customers in the e-commerce sector. But what about wealth? This is the next sector. This, this is the next space. And in the same way that Amazon has provided so much value to e-commerce, as I showed you already, it's going into social commerce and people investing online. And it's going to happen with or without you. And it's going to happen with or without me and Lee. It's going to happen either way. And so Lee, quickly, before I go any further, I'll talk a lot more about this at the end and people can use their time if they want to, to, to understand more about it. But can we just talk, chuck up a quick poll if anyone is interested and, and um, in what, what I've said so far and if they would like someone to connect with them um, you know, tomorrow. So are you interested in becoming a wealth partner? Again, to be clear, a wealth partner is a shareholder in our overall group. So 
you own everything. You own the platform, the IP, all the assets, the real estate value, et cetera. Um, and, you know, if you're interested, yes. If you're not interested, no. And if you'd like to speak to someone because you have no idea, I tend to joke if we live, I say, are you interested? Yes. Are you not interested? No. And if you have no idea, put both hands in the air and, uh, and that provides people with the thing. So let's just see how people are participating. I can see that 28% of people have voted here. I'm not going to move on as a matter of principle until we get over 50%, just so that everyone can leave their emails, their Facebook, uh, watching the political antics of uh, Biden and Trump or whatever else you're up to. And uh, you can see we're up to 44% there, so nearly, nearly there. And uh, I'd like to just get us over the 50% and then I'll move on. 48%, 50%. Okay, so a bit of fun from my side. I've got, to, I've got to have fun if no one else is having fun. So what is in the media in 2020 and what can we learn from it? So again, I'm not going to talk about this. We did an entire webinar. Uh, Lee will put the link in the, in the, in the chat box. Um, if you want to watch the recording and or if you're watching the recording to this webinar, um, at the end of this webinar, you will get a landing page that has the links to all the webinars. So I'm not going to talk about this, but what I did was a webinar on the similarities from 2000 to 2020 and how much wealth has been created between Amazon, Alibaba, Facebook, Google, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and what the similarities were. Because, because patterns and trends are, are what this is all about. This is not guesswork. It's patterns and trends. And the whole thing you're going to hear tonight is fundamentals, patterns, and trends. You need to understand the fundamentals, the patterns, and the trends. If you want to predict where the future is going, you need to look for the fundamentals, the patterns, and the trends. And that brings me on to the next webinar, which is what we did in uh, uh, last week or the week before with a guy called Willem van der Post. And there's actually a scientific way to spot companies that are going to be highly successful, that are going to 10x their competitors, both in terms of their results, their returns and everything else. And they called an EXO, an exponential organization. Now, the non-negotiable is that they've got purpose. And then there are five uh, things on the left, which is the left brain, and it's called ideas. And there's five things on the right, which is the right brain, and it's called scale. And Willem van der Post is actually a, a venture a builder, which some people know as a venture capitalist. And there's a scientific formula for success. So again, if you're interested in that, I'd recommend going and watching it. I'm not going to repeat it. You know, the bottom line is it's there. You can go watch the recording. However, it leads into the third one, which is where I always like to start with this. And the gentleman's name is Ronald Wayne. And funny enough, I got sent this just the other day. It was in a London tube. If you've ever been on the London tubes, uh, it, it was one of the signs. And um, I'd like you to tell me quickly, who is Ronald Wayne? And if you've seen me present before, you should know. But either way, I think there's a good little metaphor to be learned from Ronald Wayne because tonight we are going to share a huge amount of information. And the previous two webinars, we've shared a huge amount of information. And I think we can learn a lot from the metaphor of Ronald Wayne. So anyone want to take a guess as to who Ronald Wayne is? I'll give you a clue. There's a, a logo in the top right corner. So, yep, we've got it there. Co-founded Apple, Apple investor, sold out of Apple. You're all right. And I don't know what the exact number was, but in 1976, he sold 10% in Apple for $2,300 that today is worth $70 billion. And to be honest, it's probably worth quite a lot more because when I picked up this picture, Apple in the last uh, 18 months has gone absolutely uh, crazy. And so, what's the metaphor? Well, you know, 1976 uh, to today, you know, this man now fixes um, uh, vending machines. And wouldn't we all like to know the information? And so, whether you like what you're going to hear tonight or not, you know, we, we, we're not for everybody. I want to be clear. We don't want everyone to become a shareholder. We don't want everyone to be an investor. Um, but for some people, it resonates true to them. It talks to the intuition. And we'll talk about that later. But for those, sometimes it's good not to pass up on opportunity. So let's look at this quickly. And the world has changed so much with, with uh, COVID. And I don't know, Lee, if you've even looked at these stats, I've dated them today. But this little airline was started in 1924. It's the biggest in the world. It's the oldest operational airline in the world. It's in 334 cities in 64 countries, it employs 80,000 people. 
and it's worth $38 billion. And this little company was started in 2009. It's in 83 countries and 858 cities worldwide. Uh, it's got 26,000 employees and it's worth 62 billion. So nearly double. And just by the way, that's post COVID. <laughs> okay, uh, that's the up today. That's literally the, the stock price uh, today. And, um, and then we go to, to Marriott. And in 1927, it was started 200,000 employees, 487, 4,087 properties, 80 countries, 697,000 rooms, $18 billion company. It was the first company to allow people to book online. And then this little company started in 2008, 6,300 employees. They're in 100,000 cities. I mean, that's incredible. 100,000 cities. Uh, 220 countries or areas, which I did find confusing because as I understand it, there's only 193 countries in the world. And uh, they got 7 million listings. So to compare, uh, Marriott was 697,000 and they've got 7 million. So they like, whatever the maths is there, nine or 10 times the size. And what's interesting is that their valuation was 32 billion prior to COVID and today is 18 billion. So they've nearly halved because of COVID. Now, is Airbnb a good long-term bet? Do you think tourism will come back? Do you think people are going to travel more? In fact, do you think from a lifestyle perspective, people are going to travel more now or work harder living in New York or London or Sydney? Just a point. So short term, you can say, oh, the value has gone down. I'll show you some other little stories of what went down over time. So let's look at this quickly. And... This is really interesting. So if I open this up to you quickly and I go to this uh, slide here, this is from the Wall Street Journal. You've got to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. But this is the value that's been created since 2014 in the tech space. And uh, these are all the billion dollar companies. And you can just see it's virtually populating as it happened. Now it's quite interesting that uh, you'll see that it only gets to the end of 2019. And I would be absolutely fascinated to see this thing continue into 2020. Because as much as people think it's gone down, a lot of tech stocks have actually doubled, tripled, quadrupled uh, during this time. And I would be absolutely fascinated to see what it looks like uh, with 2020 included. Um, but I think we can safely say that a lot of value has been created uh, in the last five years. Now, what does that mean? And what can we learn from it? Well, I can actually simplify that for you. If you look at any of these brands and you'll recognize all of them, Amazon, Apple, Uber, EasyJet, Airbnb, Google, eBay, Facebook, there's only three things that technology companies do when they come into a space. They increase the trust, they increase the transparency, they increase the accessibility. So those are the three things they increase. And they cut the cost, and they cut out the middleman. So the way I normally say it is they cut the cost, they cut the middleman, and they increase the trust, the transparency, and the accessibility. Those are the three things they do. Every single industry, that's the only three things they do. And so when you look at it, and some of you have seen this slide before because it gets passed around on WhatsApp all the time, but all of these companies don't actually own any major assets, and yet they're the biggest marketplaces in the world. And so I always get a lot of joy when I do this presentation live and I say to people, so what, what are these companies exactly then? What, what can we learn? What, what is it? We all know that they don't own cars and they don't own media and they don't own inventory and they don't own real estate. So what is it that, what are these companies? Does anyone want to tell me in the chat box what it is, what they are? What's the similarity? And I'm purposely keeping my mouth shut so I'm getting you to engage. They're all disruptors. They're platforms connecting supply and demand. They're platforms. So all of them are right, but in simple terms, they are data companies. And what's really interesting is that I learned this about a year or two ago, is that if you ever wanna find an industry that's about to be disrupted where a tremendous amount of value is gonna be created, there's only two things you need to look for. One is, is there a terrible customer experience? 
And secondly, is it slow and expensive? So look at, look at taxis. Okay, before Uber turned up, no matter where you were in the world, was it hard to catch a taxi? Was it a horrible experience? And then when you caught that taxi, was it expensive and inefficient and everything? 100%. There's not anyone on this webinar that's ever caught a taxi that wouldn't agree with that. And then Uber turns up and it's just off your mobile phone, quick, safe, cuts the cost, cuts the middleman, increases the trust, the transparency and the accessibility. So the question is, and I can see, I can see banks coming up there from Jacques Pinot. I completely agree with you. Banks, property, they're like the most old, archaic industries in the world. They've literally haven't changed in centuries. And so, you know, when I look at the property industry, it's one of the most oldest, archaic, most inefficient industries. It's expensive, no one likes it, whether you're an investor, a buyer, a seller, it is just difficult, even a tenant. Okay, and, and that's why between banking, financial services, fintech, this whole space, prop tech, is, is gonna be disrupted. And you know, we did a, we did a equity crowdfunding uh, campaign back about 18 months ago in England on the top uh, European equity crowdfunding platform. And we raised two and a half million dollars from 863 investors in 43 countries. But what's so interesting is that our tagline was making global property investing available to anyone, anywhere from any amount, safe and simple. And if you want to go and check this out, I mean, they authorized, so don't take our word for it. Go and check it out. It's, you go to cedars.com forward slash wealth migrate. You can go read all about it. You can see all the information. You can, you can see the idea of the market, the team. And, um, and you know, we, it, this was like doing a mini IPO. It was extremely difficult. But what did, we do, what did we do in simple terms? Well, you know, in the old days, people used to only invest once, like Facebook goes to IPO and you'd be able to participate. Or Amazon goes to IPO and you'd be able to participate. If you're in the right boys club, and I'm sorry, Lee, I am using the word boys club, because something ridiculous like 90% of all venture capital, sorry, 96% of all venture capital goes to white males from four universities in America. So it is very much a boys club. Um, they might get involved in private equity, but actually the real opportunity is when you wanna get involved in the growth space. And, and Willem talked about it last week. So you can go watch his webinar on where real value is created. And yet most people don't get access to it. And that's really where we're using technology now to build a community company. And we're not a startup, but you're allowing people to participate uh, in this. And, and that's really what we talk about in becoming a shareholder and a wealth partner. So let's look at this new power. Now, I highly recommend you read this book. And I could do an entire webinar. Maybe, Lee, you've just found your answer for Wealthy Wednesday next week. I could do an entire webinar on, on new power versus old power. And this, this book, Richard Branson said, was the best uh, book of 20, sure, I forget now which year it was, 2018 or 2019. And it's absolutely fascinating. And there's actually a Harvard review study, which is also done on it. And if you're in business today and you haven't read this book, I'm willing to bet you that you're going to have a tough next 10 years ahead of you. <laughs> Take that as a prophecy. Because, because this new power book, these trends are happening anyway whether you like it or not. And all COVID's done is rapidly, um, you know, bring that, bring that forward. And like Jacques said, I love the Lego story. You must go and look at real businesses, old businesses like Lego, you know, um, and, and what they've done. Now, I took the entire book and, you know, called me a bit weird, but I like to put everything into simple frameworks for myself. And on the left side, you've got old power model, new power model, and you've got old power values, new power values. And on the left, you've got returns. So you can see from bottom to top, returns going up. At the bottom, you've got short-term risk. So from the left to the right. Over here, you've got exponential. And the top, you've got global and purposeful. So if you take Encyclopedia Britannica, most of you probably grew up with Encyclopedia Britannicas. And it was the fountain of all knowledge. It was the source of all knowledge. Okay. And then Wikipedia came along. And all the professors around the world said it's an absolute hypocrisy and they're never going to be able to, you know, be able to get the most accurate information and whatever. And it's so interesting because nowadays, you know, Wikipedia is the eighth most visited website in the world. It's, it's much more accurate than Encyclopedia Britannica. And I would honestly say to anyone, you need your head read if you go and buy an Encyclopedia Britannica series for your kids. They're like, why? <laughs> it be such a waste of money and space. Um, so bottom left corner, old power model, old power values, Encyclopedia Britannica all about control at the top, 
Wikipedia, 20 million people from around the world bringing the best information together and it's completely dynamic. What about Marriott Hotels or Airbnb? We've already discussed. What about Barnes and Noble, a traditional bookstore or Amazon? Or what about traditional property companies or new age kind of platform companies? Exactly the same thing. And the only thing I would say is that the short term risk is definitely higher left to right. Like it's much easier to make money from wealthy people, helping them invest in commercial buildings right now in the old traditional way through family offices and whatever. Like anyone can do that. That's been going for a hundred years. So the short term risk is definitely more in, in creating this, but the long term risk is the opposite. Because if you play to where the puck is versus where the puck is going, you could find yourself going in, in the wrong trend. So let me give you a good example of this. And back in uh, 2001, I love rugby. And I bought 11 tickets to go to the Rugby World Cup and I lost 11,000 uh, pounds through eBay, funny enough. And I learned quite quickly about social proofing. And most people don't even know what the concept of social proofing is. But when you buy something online, you've got social proofing. Now, if I buy a ticket from 7104 Leslie, who's done 974 transactions and has 100% positive feedback, I've got more chance of getting my ticket than I have of buying it off my brother. That's the way social proofing works. And, you know, most of us know how this works now, whether it's eBay, Amazon, whatever, you go in, you can see all the rankings, the ratings, the feedback, um, the top rated sellers, you know, reputation management, et cetera, et cetera. And so I tend to say to people, when it comes to investing, why could you not have silver, gold, platinum partners? Why could you not have years in business projects to date? on and off platform, niche focus, the amount of money they're investing, the amount of risk in the project, the responsiveness to communication. I can tell you one thing, most property people I've ever met are horrendous at communication. Accuracy of returns. Lee, would you be more interested in investing in a project where the partner said to you they were gonna give you a 6% return, but they have a track record over the last five years plus of 120% accuracy in predicting the returns at either that number or above? Or would you like to go for a partner that promises an 8% return, but has a 65% chance of uh, predictability of hitting their numbers over the last five years? Which one would you like? Well, I suppose that the bigger question is where you are in your risk profile, but definitely the 6% that that you are going to get because the partner is so well known and has got a proven track record because you can bank on that. You can't bank on the 8%. Exactly. So what's important is that again, social proofing, you know, anyone can tell you what they think they're going to give you, but what they actually give you is what's important. And so it's budgets, it's actuals, it's typical accounting. And then you've got badges and, you know, I could, I could again, spend an entire webinar just on this because it's gamification and, and everything else around badges and, you know, if you look at due diligence, I see a future where due diligence is going to be done where, you know, it's absolutely crazy to think you're going to have a couple of people sitting in a committee room in, a, in an office, you know, trying to decide whether it's a good building or not. You know, just like Wikipedia, where there's 19 million people that are accredited. So, Lee, I, I think you're the same as me. Neither of us are accredited on Wikipedia. We can't go on and just put anything. You've got to be accredited by the community. But there's 19 million people around the world making that decision. Well, there are perfectly good people in Cape Town in London, in Sydney, but they'd all localized knowledge. And if you take property as an example, they could do much better due diligence in Sydney of the Sydney property market than someone sitting in a, you know, investment committee and same with London and, and whatever. That's where the world's going again, with or without us, it's going to happen. I guarantee it. And it's going to happen in our lifetime. And then, you know, you talk about investment circles and, and, you know, people participating. Imagine if you had Lee's investment circle and she invites all her mates and she competes with Derek, and he invites all his mates and they actually compete with each other and, and it might be intercompany. And I mean, it's basically like super brew for investing. And again, this is where the badges come in and gamification and everything. And this is where the world's going. Like, and, uh, and you, you've got your, your network circles and everything else. So you take this all into account and you take new power, old power. And again, old power was all about complying and consuming and new power is actually about sharing. It's about affiliating. It's about adapting. So again, being part of the conversation, it's about funding. It's about being a shareholder in the company. It's about producing. So a lot of our strategic partners, like our supply property partners are also shareholders. 
And then ultimately it's about shaping. You know, again, Wikipedia actually doesn't have a board, believe it or not. It's got 19 million people and the community shapes the future of Wikipedia. And that's where I see the future of, uh, of, of these uh, 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 community platforms going. And then there's some important things to understand. So this guy, Peter Diamantes, and again, I'd highly recommend his book called Bold, um, which really, really is a good book. And he says, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest opportunities. So in the old days, you know, Mother Teresa went off to India and gave away all her worldwide wealth and lived in absolute poverty to try and save and help a few people. And, um, and nowadays you can help millions, if not billions of people, and you can add value to them and you can create a lot of economic value at the same time. And that's really what Singularity University is all about. It's, it's how do you impact a billion people in the next decade? And two things are interesting here. I've had the privilege of doing their executive program I'm on the campus. It's on the NASA campus in Silicon Valley. And, um, but we, we want to empower a billion people, but it's not because we did this course. In fact, in 2013, and you can go see it in my book, Property Going Global, we did the math that a billion people on this planet, plus minus, have access to property. And we said, why don't we look to double that <clears throat> in the next decade? Now, we're a bit behind, I'm not going to lie, because otherwise Lee and I have to do a hell of a lot in the next two to three years. <laughs> but the point being is that the idea was, and, and again, go look at that. There's some embarrassing videos on YouTube called Project Double the Wealth. But the idea was the billion wasn't just a thumb suck number. A billion people on this planet out of 7 billion have access to property. Why can we not double it in the next decade? And then when you look at exponentials, the thing I like most is, is right up the top here, ask better questions. Okay. You can see it's all about digitization. You get slow growth. So in the beginning, it's, it's all very frustrating for the team, for the shareholders, because it just feels so slow. And then, and then it just really starts to take off. And it's all about the convergence of the different technologies and this, you know, how our leaders can imagine and create a better and more abundant future. And these are all the, the really important uh, components that one looking at. Now, in simple terms, the framework is that any industry that gets changed, it gets digitized first, then there's a deceptive phase, then it's disruptive, and ultimately becomes dematerialized, demonetized, and democratized. So just like your phone, you know, nowadays in your phone, you've got everything. You've got a camera, you've got a phone, you've got a voice recorder, a compass, everything. And it's basically free with your phone. Now, if you take the wealth space or the investment space, it's literally in this brand new, it's in the digitization phase. It's not even, it's not even out of this phase. It's not even interceptive yet. If you took Uber as an example, it was interceptive when all the taxi drivers started um, blocking the airports around the world. Now, that was quite an interesting thing because all that did was get them press. And then the rest of us would see it on BBC and think, oh, that's quite a cool idea. And then we would do it. And then that became truly disruptive. Okay. And, and there's a process that everyone goes through. But I believe that wealth in our lifetime will be truly democratized. And we're going to do it. And I'm hoping many others are going to do it because I believe we can change the greatest problem on this planet. And then the other thing that's interesting is there's a guy at Singularity University that I personally got to meet and learn from called Ray Kurzweil. Now, Ray Kurzweil is, um, as I understand at the moment, is the father of, uh, of artificial intelligence at Google. He is literally known as the father of artificial intelligence worldwide. Um, he's had a, over 80% accuracy, I think it's 86% to be exact, uh, in predicting the future um, of technologies, but literally down to the year. And what's so interesting is he said the way to do that is that you look for long-term trends that are intersecting. And that's, it's, it's not guesswork. It's actually fairly easy. You look for long-term trends that are intersecting and that's where opportunity lies. So a good example he gave was the people that built Siri said there are three things that are happening. You've got the adoption of mobile phones, you've got voice recognition, and you've got artificial intelligence. And the three of them are coming together. They're converging, they built a product. And within 18 months, they sold it for a couple of hundred million dollars to Apple. That is what Ray Kurzweil is teaching. And what is the whole webinar about tonight? Told you already. Fundamentals, patterns, and trends. Because if you understand the fundamentals, you can spot the patterns, and you can see the trends converging. That's where opportunity lies. So let me give you an example. Back in 1995, there were 16 million people on the internet. To be honest, they were all the computer geeks, because the only people that could use the internet were people that could program. And then came along Netscape. And Netscape was a user interface that allowed you and me access to the internet. We didn't need to program. It gave us easy access. And literally today, there are you know, 
arguably between four to five billion people on the internet. Now, someone that spotted that little trend was a, was a little company called Amazon and a guy called Jeff Bezos. And Jeff Bezos was actually, funny enough, a stockbroker in New York. And in 1994, he heard about this whole internet trend. He resigned from his job and he moved to Silicon Valley and he started a company to sell books. And it was really interesting because their growth is based on four things. They've been resolute on focusing on their customers. They've only ever thought long-term. It got him into a lot of trouble in the short term from his shareholders and the market and everything, but he always thought long-term. It's never either or. So it, it, is it black or white? It's relevant. It's both. Find a way to think about the customers and think long-term. And then every day is day one. No matter how successful you are, every single day is day one. And what did it mean? Well, you know, he says, if you're prepared to go and, and to go after a long-term trend, you must be willing to fail. You have to be willing to work, to think long-term, and you have to be willing to be misunderstood for long periods of time. And what's interesting is when you look at this growth, you know, if you invested $10,000 in Amazon pre-IPO, today it'd be worth, it's 12 to 20 million, depending on <laughs> what value you want to work on. Okay. And, you know, what's more interesting to me is that in the last crash, and, and again, we did an entire webinar on this in 2000, there's a specific strategy that they used, which we, you, we are copying called convertible debt, that when everyone else was going bankrupt, they used it to innovate, to grow, and to take market share. And if you invested $10,000 at that time, today it's worth $152 million. Okay, but what did they do? They became a platform business. You know, another good example was Naspes. In the heart of 2000, they invested in, uh, in Tencent, $32 million, 2001. It was the greatest private equity investment ever made by any company in the world um, based on the returns that they've received because of the, the results are, are just phenomenal. And if you invested $10,000 today, it'd be worth nearly $60 million. And so to put it in perspective, and I, this table came from the first webinar, but if you invested $10,000 in 2000, so again, you spotted the trends, you understood you know, the patterns and you understood the fundamentals, and you invested in Amazon, Alibaba, Elon Musk, or Naspers, any one of them, you know, look at the, the millions of dollars you would have created with $10,000. Okay. Now, am I saying that every technology company is going to succeed? No. That's why we've got seven webinars, because there's patterns, there's trends, and there's fundamentals. And Lee, you can tell me to shut up if I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Um, so let's look at some of these trends. Now, when I looked at these eight technology trends, Lee said to me, you know, I've got to have original content. And I looked at these and I thought, well, have any of these eight trends really changed? And do I need to go out and change my presentation? And after a lot of reflection last night, I don't agree because these are the trends for the next decade. Blockchain, solving trust, artificial intelligence, connecting us with the world's intelligence, big data algorithms and quantum computing, helping people make smart investments, VR, AR, experience the reality. O2, connecting, you know, the offline world with the online world and vice versa. Mobile phones. If it's not mobile, it doesn't exist almost. 3D printing and the digital layer, the whole IoT. These are the eight things. Now, let's just, you know, we don't have time tonight to go into all these in a huge amount of detail. But what is blockchain? And you might or might not have seen this video before. If you've seen it, go have a quick toilet break. If you haven't seen it, watch this video because it's the best explanation of blockchain. And I will say one thing. From everything that I've read, blockchain is going to have a bigger impact on your life in the next 10 years than the internet has in the last 20. This is the seller. This is the buyer. This is the middleman. Cutting out the middleman can be a great thing, unless you're the middleman. And there are a lot of middlemen or intermediaries out there. Entire industries, such as payments or securities clearing, have evolved to rely on them. Why? Because they establish trust where there is none. They establish ownership, that the seller has the right to sell what's being sold. They attest to history, that there is a clean transaction history. And they certify ability, that the buyer has the money to buy it pretty critical details when you don't know the person on the other side of the transaction. Intermediaries know and trust one another. Their business is based on it, so they have more to lose than gain from breaching that trust. But what if there were a better, cheaper middleman? One that didn't add as much cost, complexity, and chance for error. 
There might be. It's called blockchain, and it has the potential to disrupt the entire ecology of intermediaries. It's a distributed ledger that relies on large networks of computers that redundantly encode transaction data by solving complex mathematical equations. The secure ledger provides an inviolable record. If the history of an instrument is incorruptible and available to all parties, there's no need for a third party to vouch. Blockchain is proof of ownership, history, and ability in non-centralized encrypted form. It's fast, transparent, and free of error. The question is not whether blockchains can cut out the middlemen in complex transactions, but rather which middlemen and when. So, if you're a middleman, beware. Hmm. Your days are numbered. Uh, George asked a great question here. For wealth to be democratized, wouldn't it mean that Uber, as an example, should offer their drivers shareholding? Wouldn't that be the simplest way to spread the wealth? Completely. And that's the difference between a, a investor, entrepreneur, or even business 4.0 and the whole concept of investor, wealth, uh, entrepreneur, society 5.0, which is it's about collaborative winning versus individual winning. It's not about a few people winning at the top of Uber. It's about everyone winning. And um, I'm going to share some of that with you tonight. So I agree with you completely, um, George. Nine industries that will soon be disrupted by blockchain. Well, I think the two obvious ones are banking and real estate. You know, think about it. Like they're all about middlemen. I mean, it's completely complex and difficult. And, uh, and it's really, you know, about, um, you know it's going to happen. <laughs> it's not a doubt. The blockchain video available. Is the blockchain video available? Yeah, it's um, trying to think. Um, you can just go and Google it. Um, it's, it's on YouTube. Okay, let's do the second one, artificial intelligence. So Ray Kurzweil said that artificial intelligence will reach human levels by around 2029. Follow that out further to say 2045, and we have multiple intelligence, the human biological machine intelligence of our civilization a billion fold. So that gets a bit scary, I'm not gonna lie. And then you look at a little guy who came from Pretoria called Elon Musk. And again, if I, um, if I go here, these articles, by the way, I've actually shared in the presentation at the end. So anyone that um, is live on the webinar is going to get a copy of the presentation and all the links are there later. Um, but Elon Musk is literally disrupting eight industries, uh, primarily through, um, and one of them is open AI, which is AI machine learning, competitive gaming, and neural link. Um, so it's really interesting what's happening in the space, um, primarily in AI. And he's actually really concerned about the impact of AI on the, on, on the planet. Um, but he doesn't dispute it's coming. But what he's decided to do is to build eight companies. So most people know him for Tesla or SpaceX. Uh, most people don't know that he's actually got a whole bunch of other companies all based on AI. So again, go and, go and read that article. What about big data? So this one's really interesting to me and, and one that we've been fairly weak in so far. But you know, we've got an investor test and we've got a process called GITS, which is the Global Investment to Learn System. And one day I'd like to see us have a future where we've got smart investing. So what that means is Lee comes along, she does her investor test, it marries together with her profiling and how high is her risk category. We've got a thing called the personal driving dynamics and everything, you put it all together. And it actually says to Lee, like based on this property or this investment, doesn't have to be property, it could be any investment or wealth space. You could like say, well, listen, based on your criteria, this would make more sense to you. And Lee, if you invest in South Africa and you want to retire when you're 60, you're probably going to retire when you're 62 based on long-term trends. And if you invest in Timbuktu, you know, you can retire when you're 56. It allows you to do future proofing. Now, everything I'm talking about is a reality today. It exists today. Nothing is new technology. It's algorithms, it's big data, it's just bringing it together. All that has to happen is you just need to be able to put the technology together. Now, I got blown away and I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about a company that Ken Williams sent to me two days ago and I listened to. And ironically, they're doing this literally at the moment already. Like, so I've been talking about this for, I don't know, at least two years. And they're actually already doing it. They're using wave technology, 
mixed over overlaid with uh, with big data um, they've actually patented this so they can provide a completely personalized service uh, to their clients so that every client gets a personalized service based on their needs um, and and what data they, they need vr and ar i think this one's fairly self-explanatory virtual reality but the one that's more exciting is augmented reality so i'm wearing glasses tonight imagine if you were walking around you could see the world you had a mixture of you know, like imagine if I walk up to Lee and I can't remember Lee's name and LinkedIn's over there and it's like, yep, you know, Lee, you went to university with Lee, you know, et cetera. And you can just kind of read it. And, and if you think this is, this is a bit weird, you know, literally this year, my son was sent a game and um, on, on Google now, you can go and Google an animal, a crocodile, a tiger, a lion. And it's not hugely real yet. I mean, look at some of these things, but on your cell phone, he had an alligator coming out of the water in Nisana Lagoon. He had a tiger standing next to him in the room. And he had a lion, you know, not, ne not necessarily, it looks much more like an American lion than, a, than an African lion. But the point being is that um, this is an eight-year-old that's growing up with this. Like, this will not be difficult or, or you know, this will be weird to you and me, but it won't be to, an, to him when he grows up. O2O, this is online to offline. And um, SoftBank Vision Fund, you know, this is a really interesting one. And you know, what they've invested in and the three waves of, of the internet where it's gone from web 1.0 to web 2.0 to web 3.0. Now, again, I'm going to talk about this all in, in the webinar on the 4th of November around wealth 5.0 and where we are and where we're going. There's a great article that uh, I shared in the last webinar where Roger Hamilton shared with us the top uh, 10 people that a year ago said were best uh, suited for the coming changes. And, and none of us a year ago knew that COVID was coming. And number one was Mayashi Sun from SoftBank and, and what he did and, and how he's done it and how he's built the biggest uh, venture capital fund in the world. He raised $45 billion in 45 minutes based on where the world is going. And uh, again, these, the, these are the trends and patterns I've been talking to you about. And what's really interesting is that the Vision Fund is primarily going after uh, real estate, uh, the global transportation, uh, transportation and the retail market because they're the three markets they believe have the most opportunity. So if you're watching this and you're in the property space, like whether you like it or not, the, the, the smart money is coming <laughs> to a space near you. The next one is mobile phones. And, um, you know, it's really interesting. By 2025, the majority of the world's planet will actually have access to mobile phones, smartphones and the internet. And that means that we currently got 4 billion people online. It means the rest of the population uh, worldwide will be online. You know, so anywhere from three to 4 billion new people will be joining uh, the global uh, economy. They, they're, not, they're not part of the global economy at the moment. And they will be, they'll be part of the global economy. And what does that mean? You know, it, it's absolutely massive. And, and we're gonna talk about that. This one's interesting. And why is it not playing? Oh, where's my video gone? Oh, well. Um, I thought I had my video, but it's it d disappeared. Anyway, um, I can just go and Google uh, um, 3D printing property, you know, and, and you'll see a plethora of them coming up. You know, this house here was built in Russia for less than $10,000 uh, and they, they're coming down more and more. So when you talk about the wealth gap and you talk about affordability, you know, this is going to completely change people's access uh, to property. And then lastly, the digital layer there, you know, they call this IOT, which is the um, internet of things. And there's just millions of, of little um, sensors all over the world that are gathering data all day long. And, and this is where we live in the real world. And there's the digital layer, the two intersecting. Now, again, this could scare the hell out of you, or you could say the tsunami's coming. How do I embrace it? It, you don't get a choice. <laughs> it's happening with or without you, um, unless you want to go and live in uh, Porfader or something. Um, so let's look at the eight social trends. These are the ones that I've spent a bit of time on uh, in preparation for this webinar. How are we doing for time here? And um, the first one is social commerce and collaborative investing. Now, again, we've been talking about this for years, which increases the returns and reduces the risk for investors. The second is the rise of the middle class. And I would actually say this is even more. It's not just the rise of the middle class. There's actually three components here. It's the rise of the middle class. It's the 3 billion, three to 4 billion unbanked that are joining the global economy. And it's everyone that is deemed to be a retail investor is equally coming into the economy. 
because previously Lee and me were unsophisticated, unaccredited investors and probably a lot of you online. And that meant we could only go and deal with some terrible bloody insurance product full of crappy fees and earn no return. And I'm sorry if I'm being direct, but it's a fact. And, and it's so interesting because the laws, which were made in 1932, the, the, you know, some of the SEC rules in America in 1932, protect the retail investor because shame, poor little retail investor, they don't know what they're doing. But there's no law in buying a house where you can lose money. And there's no law even worse than going to Las Vegas and losing money. But you can't make money. You can't invest like in proper deals. It's illogical and it's changing. Globalization. You could probably see on the, on the screen behind me here, yeah, Donald Trump and Biden are having a good go at each other. You know, is America the right place to invest? Is South Africa the right place to invest? Is China the right place to invest? The only overriding thing is nowhere is the right place to invest. The only right place to invest is to think like a global citizen and to invest globally. Blockchain and cryptocurrencies, I'm going to talk to you about uh, STOs and what's happening in this space. The social pressure to democratize wealth, it's, it's dramatic. Uh, gamification is having a huge uh, impact and is fundamentally changing the education system. Personalization, this one is one of the game changers that, that actually in the last six to 12 months for me personally has been one of the biggest changes. And then investors wanting to have a purposeful impact. And I want to, I want to basically, um, those are all very exciting until the power fails. Interesting, uh, Lena, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I don't know if you're saying that you just had load shedding. Um, I've just paid for a battery pack um, to be installed at my house. So I will be completely load shed resilient. Um, right, let's look at this one. Social commerce and collaborative investing. Lee, I don't know if you can find the links. They're in the e-wealth pack. They're the first two links in the blogs of the e-wealth pack around social commerce and collaborative investing. And it really looks at what's happened over the time between the different periods in history, production, marketing, commerce, compliance, regulation, and trust, and then brands that best represent it. And, you know, I don't have time tonight to go all the way through this, but ultimately we're in a space of collaborative smart investing. Now collaborative investing has been around for centuries. There's five principles of collaborative investing, but it was only kept for the kings and queens and monarchs of the previous uh, generations. And the reason we've called it collaborative smart investing is that just like you've got a smart TV, a smart watch, a smart phone, you know, why can we not have collaborative smart investing? And so let's look at some real life examples. This here is an example from Prudential. They're a massive um, investment firm. And it's quite interesting because they're coming out at the moment and they're saying DIY investing is fun but risky. How do they make their money? They're a middleman. They charge fees. And statistically, 96% of fund managers don't beat the market average over 15 years. So imagine giving your money to someone to go to a casino and 96% of the time they were going to lose you money, but they would charge you fees all the way through the process. And 4% of the time they would beat the averages and make you more money. They still charge you fees. Would, would you honestly give your money to that person to go to a casino with those, with those odds? No? But it's interesting because you give your money to financial managers and those are the odds that they're playing with. And so what's interesting here is that they ran an entire campaign on why it's fun but risky. Why? Because someone's eating their lunch. This is like taxi drivers uh, blockading the Heathrow airport and saying, you shouldn't allow Uber. It's not right. It's not fair. <laughs> you know, sorry, I shouldn't say this, Lee, but no shit, Sherlock. It's not. <laughs> what you've been doing for the last hundred years is not right and it's not fair. And, uh, and we don't need you. What about this? There's an airline going out of business and, uh, and it's about to be crowdfunded. And uh, we actually know, I know the guy personally, I've known him for 15 years that's behind this. I think it's quite cool. I like not just to make a return, maybe, maybe I'll invest and be able to own an airline. I can pretend I'm Richard Branson. What about this? Uh, bridging the gap in property finance. You know, one of the biggest problems in getting access to finance is the banks. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a company that's out there bridging the gap in, in property finance. And, you know, these are all the principles of Wealth 5.0 which again, we'll, we'll run an entire webinar uh, just around. So this space, I can go on forever. And, and all these links that I've given you, um, you can actually go and read all the links. I've actually got them all ready to go for you over here. So if you go here, 
Um, all these different links, I've actually got all the links, so you can go and read all of them. <coughs> um, and you can, you can see everything that's going on here. So let's move along now and the rise of the emerging class, middle class. Now, I've already kind of spoken to this one, but I think what's important here is, is this article here. And, and this one I am going to, uh, sorry, what am I doing here? I need to jump one slide and I need to go back to my, to my main slides. And I want to show you this article here. So this is a really interesting article about digital platforms and everything. And it talks about how, you know, because of COVID, the tech stocks have taken off. There's been a global market disruption. Key trends remain strong. Increased popularity of digital platforms. Focus on private markets and burgeoning interest in ESGs. Millennial and Gen Z traders were already a growing presence and before the pandemic, but have widened the universe of investors considerably. So do you see how I've said to you, it's not even just the rise of the middle class anymore. It's the rise of the retail investor. Because they might only invest, um, you know, $1,000. But if 1,000 people invest $1,000, it's a $1 million. And you can keep going on and on and on. It becomes a, a quite much larger amount of money than trying to find a couple of high net worths with a lot of money. It talks about, you know, what's happened in the SMP. It talks about all the different trends and how the fundamentals haven't changed, but it really, this is the important part, the transformation in retail investing. Perhaps the biggest transformation has taken place in the retail investing front. While millennial and Gen Z traders were already making their presence felt, um, the scope of activity and the ability to move the stocks and markets has widened considerably. It talks about private markets and ETFs, and then it talks about social responsible investing. And uh, this is where it says, but while billions of dollars flow into environmental, social, and corporate governance, ESG funds and strategies, an important question remains who qualifies them and then talks about how to actually qualify them. Like these again are trends you, you can't pass up. They're happening again with, with or without you. So um, global capitalization. This one's an interesting one. Um, we've got a webinar. I think it's the next one actually um, on, on Ray Dalio and where the world is going. And uh, a lot of talk about America and, you know, is there problems with America? And if I go back to the different slides here, I've got um, this one here. It's, you know, is America about to collapse? Uh, billionaire Ray Dalio, who's probably the most respected commentator in, in global economics, talking about the US being in a period of great risk and that investors need to diversify. You know, here he's talking about the changing world order here he's talking about um, the problem with the US dollar. And again, I, I can do a whole webinar on this. And, 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 and just because you asked nicely, we're going to do a whole webinar on it. So I'm not going to waste an entire trend uh, just on, we're going to, we actually, sorry, let me rephrase that. I'm going to invest an entire webinar just on this trend uh, because we think it's so important. What about blockchain and cryptocurrencies? So we have another webinar. Oh, you might be noticing what's going on here. Um, which is the 16th of November. And it's a panel discussion between Willem van der Post and David Orban. And, and David Orban literally is a, a faculty member of Singularity University. He's one of the earliest investors in, um, in EOS and, um, and, and Ethereum. And he's literally one of, the, one of the forefront people in exponential technologies, blockchain, cryptocurrency. And what's so interesting is that one of the people, one of the people we work with as well, Paul Niederer, has been sharing all these links with me of all these different um, blockchains. So, you know, we, we were on the blockchain as far back as uh, 2016. And um, these, these are, you know, we were probably ahead of our time uh, by quite a long way, to be honest. Um, but these are all now becoming critical mass. And it's all about STOs, which are security token offerings. And um, you can see, so in this one here is swapping digital assets. This one here is finding your perfect agents. This one here is cross-border real estate investing powered by blockchain. Uh, this one here is the first stock exchange for real estate in the world. Administration to trading now open. Uh, digital shares for the world. Uh, real IT review. Um, and this one here is even a video, um, which I'll share with our, um, with our inner circle and stuff. Again, all the links are on the PowerPoint as well. And then... So I think we can safely say that this blockchain space is dramatically you know, changing things. And, and this is quite an interesting article. Does digitization democratize real estate assets? 
and it's something that um, someone asked, I forget, sorry, who it was, but around like the Uber thing. And I don't know where that article's suddenly gone to now. Um, sorry, I've lost that article. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but that article is, is a really interesting one. And it talks about what needs to happen in that space. Now, again, the link is, is in the platform, so you can go and read it. And, um, and then this is, you know, a, a funding document I was seeing. The thing I like here is that, you know, it's so interesting in the property space, you know, get used to getting paid every quarter, if it's commercial, every month, if it's, if it's you know, um, uh, residential. You know, why can't we be paid daily? If it's all been done properly, why can't it be paid daily? Uh, micropayments. It's happening. So, and then one thing I found really interesting, I got sent this yesterday, is that many mid-sized STOs, security token offerings in mainland Africa, while South, with South African partner, South Africa supports tokenization through close contact with the regulator. So we've been working with the regulator. In fact, I founded the Crowdfunding Association of Africa back in 2015. And they're becoming really proactive now in, in this whole space, um, which is really exciting. Social pressure to democratize wealth. Well, you know, we've got the 17 sustainable goals and everything around Society 5.0 is actually around this. At the top DeFi projects to watch in the second half, and there's a whole article on this um, here, which, and again, I, I, you know, I don't actually know if I'm allowed to share this stuff, but um, you know, this is all the information I get kind of from all the inner circles I'm part of. And um, it's just really interesting to me because my job in the company is not to focus on what we need to do today, it's to focus on where we need to be tomorrow. It's not to focus on where the puck is today or even where it's going in the next three months. It's to, it's, oh, what is it? A good player focuses on where the puck is going. A great player focuses on where it's going next. <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> you get my point. Uh, and, and that's really quite important. Gamification is an important one. So I, um, I highly recommend um, listening to this uh, webinar. And uh, there's a webinar here. And, and actually enough, this guy was a friend of um, Ken Williams. And he basically, um, he was at Deitcher with Ken. He was head of equities at Deitcher. And there's an interview here that, we, um, that I watched just in the last two days. And they've gone and created a community. And if you look here, what, what they've done at, at Investor is they've created an academy. Um, so it's a learning place. Uh, Lee called that Wealth University. They've got podcasts, uh, which is like webinars and updates and, and everything. They've got market blogs. Um, and then what they've done is they've also got a game. Okay, so it's all about the community. They've, they've literally invested in the community. And so what's so interesting to me is that if you go here, they've got fantasy finance. Um, they've got, you know, so it's all about this gamification. And what he said here is that the, the, the revolution of the retail investor is the greatest business opportunity in the finance investment banking space, literally in decades. On top of that, the only way to unlock it is through community and through education and through gamification and people. And, and what he said is that they did a poll of 4,000 millennials and they're not interested in what experts have to say. They're not interested in what Scott thinks or, or you know, Donald Trump thinks or whatever. They're interested in what their peers think. And that's why social proofing is so important. And that's why if people think that the likes of investment committees or family offices are where the world is going, it's going to be like that for plus minus the next 10 years. And then it's done. Because it won't work like that anymore. And uh, so anyway, I can, I've given you all those links as well. Um, but I'd highly recommend listening to this podcast. And then personalization. Now this one's an interesting one to me. And sorry, I'm just trying to check time here. Um, <laughs> Lee, I think we need to turn this into a half day workshop in future. And, um, and uh, personalization is, is really, we've been talking about this for a while. This is quite an old slide around the amount of personalization consumers have. But one of our new board advisors is Willem van der Post, and he's an investor in Offernet. And it talks about the digital enterprise and it talks about the digital consumer. And what's so important is that there's a whole algorithm. So when we talk about algorithms, big data, you know, they've got MIT, MIT PhDs, et cetera. And what this basically means is that it ultimately comes down to complete personalization. You know, we've still got a problem at Wealth Migrate and the Global Wealth Group where, you know, we send everyone all the information. And there are some people that are interested in the eight trends and there's some people that don't care. And all they want to know is when the next English property is going live. 
this is the personalization people want. It's got to be right down to what are you interested in and how can we give it to you? How can we add value to you specifically? And this is where personalized niches are becoming so important. And if you get it right, what's interesting is that the cost per unit and the return on spend, so the, it, the costs go down and the return goes up because you're spending less money targeted on the people that really want it versus just hoping, spraying and praying. And, um, and I love this article called The Society of Tinkerers. And again, you know, in the old days, you, I started off right in the beginning. You used to go to university, you used to go to a course, you used to read a book, and then you go out and buy a property, or then you go out and you know, get a job. Whereas nowadays, we're a society of tinkerers. We learn while doing. Okay, so rather than try and invest $100,000 and make a mistake, invest $100 and learn. And that's the whole society of tinkering and, and, and improving and, and, and growing. And then the last trend is the power of impact investing. And, you know, this, this is becoming a trillion dollar industry just this year. And it's so interesting because I think, George, you asked the question, but there's this uh, article about the startup. And it's so funny because I said, to, I said to some of our partners in the multifamily industry, I said, listen, guys, we're funding the building, but why don't we give every single tenant a piece of the building? Or, or don't give it to them, but when they pay their rent, let's say they pay $800 a month, $50 is going towards owning a piece of the building. You'll have a much better tenant, you're completely changing their perspective from being a tenant to an owner, and you're uplifting society, and everyone's winning. There's no downside. And there's actually a company that's not doing this, and, and we are talking to our multifamily uh, partners about this, because this is truly how the world is changing. And, and this is where, if you come back to my slideshow, this is what that ESG is all about, because it's, it's not just about yourself and making a profit. It's about the environment. It's about the societal consequences. It's about the corporate governance of doing it. There's another good article here about women investors. Now, if you're a woman, I would be extremely excited about the next decade. And uh, it's happened to a couple of my articles. They seem to, oh, there it is. Um, because this is a trend that is going to be one of the most massive trends in the next 10 years. And that's women becoming empowered, women wanting to take control of their financial destiny. And, and it's changing so quickly. And, and what's interesting is as the wealth changes from the baby boom generation to the millennials, more than 60% of, of the capital is going to be controlled by women in the next 10 years. Interesting. So, you know, as a white male, I need to look at it and go, well, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> it's a fact. Um, um, but, it, but, but again, the old trends are not going to work. It's just not going to happen. And, um, and this is where, this, is where you know, this, this article, sorry, so maybe that, maybe that thing was coming up a bit later, this upread, so I obviously had it twice. Um, here it is here. And what is, what is happening and how is it democratizing? And what are the seven steps that have to be considered? The value of the asset, the security regulations, KYC, AML, what needs to happen and how it's actually happening. And um, it's really, really important. I mean, we, you know, we came out three years ago with a, with a utility token. We've been waiting for the security token exchanges uh, to go live. We've been waiting for the regulations, but it's happening. It's simmering now. In, in the next year or two, things are starting to evolve. And this is, this is where, the world, where the world is moving to. Okay. And then Lee, I thought I'd add a bit of a bonus. Um, and I, I want to add another three trends. I think speed is, is a trend. Um, things are happening so much faster now. You know, when you look at how fast things are happening around the world, you know, you really have to be able to move and adapt quickly. You know, if you go to university and think you're going to get a four-year degree and come out at the end and know everything, you're dreaming. Because within four years, things have completely changed. And that's another reason why you have to learn. And, and equally, businesses, you know, that's why Entrepreneur 5.0 is the way forward. Fully digital, data-driven, high-tech, and high-touch. If you don't have those things, you won't succeed. Um, the second is that they pivoted and, uh, very rapidly in the crisis. So they had COVID, they pivoted quickly, they cut what wasn't working, and they doubled down on what was working. You know, Amazon spent $4 billion in April when the rest of the world was running and scared this year. Amazon spent $4 billion, um, you know, growing and expanding. Now, interesting enough, they did that 20 years ago. So they obviously learned that in a crisis, there's opportunity. And then lastly, they've got high trust with their investors, their team, and their customers. And that allowed them to fill their bank accounts and gave them fuel to accelerate out of trouble. Trust is everything. And it's all about the community. And then lastly, it's about being resourceful. And I've done a couple of webinars on, on resourcefulness. 
And I just think this is such an important concept. And, and I, you know, again, I'm not going to talk about it too much tonight because you can go watch one of the one of the other webinars that we've done on. So what does this all mean? Well, you've got no ordinary disruption because over the next 10 years, we're going to have one of the most interesting times in human history because you've got technology disruption, you've got cultural society disruption. You, when, we, when we do the, the event with Prof. Ruli in three weeks, you'll actually notice that you've got economic, you've got political um, also coming into that, and you've got environmental. So there's actually five different disruptions, but for tonight, I'm going to keep it simple. There's only two. So it's, there is actually a five-dimensional graph, but tonight I'm going to keep it simple. There's only two. And you can, you can go and read about it. And that's why we, many years ago, created our ecosystem, because it's not about having one thing. You've got to have an education platform. You've got to have an entry level. You've got to have a university. You've got to have a movement and a way for people to get access. And so we spoke about Wealth Create, where it's not to $1,000. We haven't launched this yet. The technology and the regulation has not allowed this. We launched Wealth Migrate in the beginning because that was the mid market that was a thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars and we're in the process of launching private wealth which is going to be the the high net worth brand it's the hundred thousand dollar plus but what have we done really in simple terms we've built the technology to make global real estate investing easy what you used to have to do in months or years you can now do in minutes you get access to the best partners the best opportunities and literally from a thousand dollars and you know, rather than focusing on the hassles of management, maintenance, tax structuring, you now just get access to the best returns. You get access to global you know, partners and it can be as diversified from medical buildings to game reserves. When you look at some of the buildings we've done over the years, you know, an 8% cash on cash return, 13 to 20% IRRs, medical buildings in America, residential buildings in England, industrial buildings in, in Australia, and even commercial opportunities in, Ameri in, in South Africa. And so whether it's America, England, Australia, or South Africa, you don't have to choose anymore. And our business model is really simple. We go out and we find trusted partners. So we don't do the deals ourselves. We find trusted partners. They list their, their opportunities on the platform. You and I get access to those opportunities. And then we can literally sign up on the platform. We can select an investment. We transact online and we manage, you know, you can manage your portfolio all in one place. So, who does this appeal to? Well, it tends to appeal to people that are entrepreneurial. It tends to people that want something easy and simple. They want something safe. They don't want to deal with lawyers, bank accounts, structures, and hassle. They want to be in control. They want to be, be able to not only have the control, but make their own decisions. They want diversification. They don't want to have all their money tied up in one deal, one country, one asset class, one partner. They want variety. They're happy to pay a transaction fee. They're happy to get an Uber and pay a transaction fee. They're happy to use Airbnb and pay a transaction fee but they're not happy to pay AUM, which is ongoing fees. And the metaphor I tend to give people with COVID, you know, my house, we use Airbnb. Airbnb only make money from me when they make me money. They have, Airbnb haven't charged me rent all through COVID while they weren't making me any money. But the financial industry did. While the financial industry was making you no money, they charged you fees all the way through the process. And that's the same metaphor. That's the difference between transaction and AUM. They want it automated and mobile, and they want it online. And so let's do a little live demo here. And there's nothing better than live. So if I go in here, I'm literally going to go to Wild Migrate and I'm going to log in. You can see it all, all happening live in front of you. And I'm going to sign up. And you can see me signing into the platform here. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to look at the different deals. I can go through and I can see all the different uh, deals here. I can go in and I can look at my portfolio. I can look at my wallet. Um, I can change my different structures. So International Property Solutions, an American company, it's not KYC yet, uh, but my personal name is KYC. I can go and see all my different wallet transactions. I've got an offshore structure as well. So very much like banking, I can go and, uh, and I can do everything. And what is going on there? Okay, so it's, it's given me my available balance. And what's so interesting is I can go and do it in all different currencies. I can go and do it in rands. I can do it in pounds. I can do it in dollars. And I can ultimately see uh, what is going on uh, with everything. So let's go back to the marketplace and let's go to First Central Towers. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but this is a massive company, about $13 billion under management. I go in and I view this deal. I read all through it. I see the different pictures. I'm um, at the banking tower in, in, in Florida. Um, I like the partner, I like the deal. 
So I read all about the risk. I can read the market summary, the investment summary. I can go read all about the sponsor and the due diligence. I can read about the risks. I can download all the documents. But anyway, I've done my due diligence on this and I decide I want to invest in this deal. I basically load it up and I say, right, I want to invest uh, $9,000 and I can see the fees, everything completely transparently. I go in, I literally acknowledge uh, all the documents. I can download and read the investment application and conversion. Obviously I do that and then I can agree and I can make my investment. And what you basically watched in under a minute is me investing in America. Now, if I go back to my portfolio, um, you can actually go in now and sorry, you can see that I've actually invested there. Now, the reason it's in RANDs is that um, I can change the currencies because again, you're a global citizen, you wanna know everything. And you can see that I've got $9,000 pending. Now, if I go into um, any one of my other portfolios, you can go into my portfolio, you can actually see. And one of my challenges at the moment is that the majority of my properties are American in this American LLC dream provider. And so I've got to still get this KYC. We've had problems KYCing American entities. Um, but I think you get the point um, of the live demo, which is that in a little under two minutes, once you've set up your account, funded your wallet, you can go and become a global investor and invest around the world. Now we've got members in 152 countries. We've got investors from 62 countries. We've done over $600 million in value, you know, thousands of transactions, over $100 million through the platform, you know, uh, tens of millions of dollars being paid out in, in dividends now. We've won numerous different awards. But probably the one I'm high, you know, proudest of from a team perspective has got a higher than 70% reinvestment rate. You know, this is what the world looks like in terms of the coverage of where the investors are. And what's interesting to me is that when we started out, the minimum investment was $100,000, then we got to $10,000, then we got $1,000. We, we beta tested and played around with $100. The dream is to get it to $1. But you need to have multiple different brands. So again, Wealth Create will be the naught to 1,000. Wealth Migrate will be 1,000 to 100,000. And private wealth group will be specifically the private banking solution, you know, that, that people would expect um, for 100,000 plus. When you look at the competitor landscape, there's plenty of platforms that are out there, but every single one of them is localized in a local area. And we, we wanted to provide the global solution. And so that's what we did. Um, we started with the end in mind. And so when you look at the business model, it's all about the platform. And you can see the platform here, and I've actually, sorry, this is, a, I need to update the slide because it's actually um, wealth point. Um, and really what the business model is, is we go out and we get multiple different demand channels, both B2C, business to consumer, B2B, business to business, and B2B, business to platform. And we get multiple different supply channels. And what's interesting, you might or might not have heard of this, but it's platform as a service, it's called PaaS. So some people have heard of software as a service. Well, this is exactly what it is, our platform can enable either white label partners or everyone on local marketplaces or global marketplaces, um, real estate only focused, alternative investments. Um, I've learned a whole lot in the last year between secondary markets and primary markets. In simple terms, we can do property, we can do private equity, we can do structured notes, it's all the same. And so if you look at the demand channels and you go back to it, you know, I've shown you, you know, you've got the B2C customer. We've also got B2B customers, someone like this, this person here, they help people invest in Cyprus. They help people get um, passports to invest in Cyprus. But we went and created an entire white label, all the look and feel, their colors, and their clients can go in and they can choose the properties they want to put on. And so now they can add value to their customers and they can monetize um, on the back end. You know, Easy Equities is one of the largest stockbrokers in Africa now and online. They want to bring out easy properties. We can literally provide them a solution in a, in, a, in a couple of hours to be able to help their investors invest globally. You know, we can have a focus on millennials. We can have a focus on women and wealth. We can have a focus on even Shirai compliant. And this is those niche personalized focus that, that we've been speaking about. And then the last part is, is the whole point of why education and why the Wealth University. And, and, and I think the most important thing, there's been a massive growth in online learning, but not yet a huge adoption in terms of online investing. And how do you do it? Well, the whole new economy is about trust. And how do you solve trust? Well, it's about bringing the two together. So it's not only about the investment, which is the green, it's also about the education. And I wanted to share with you 
again, the digital strategy of investor. And again, I recommend the listening to the webinar of how they did it. You know, he personally invested 25 million pounds himself. <laughs> um, that's what happens when you're an investment banker and you made some money over your life. And he literally focused on the gamification, the community and the social proofing. And only now after seven years, he hasn't earned one cent in revenue. And only now are they looking to, to monetize the platform. And another guy is Grant Cardone. And uh, through this exact same strategy has raised hundreds of millions of dollars uh, into his deals. And it's all about education based marketing. We've, we've sort of reverse engineered how he does it with cheap products, books, courses, live courses, um, you know, $99 products. And then ultimately, once you've done it all, you're on the platform, you get access. And then we learned and funny enough, you know, I had a, had a session just with Neil Milan today. And it's so interesting nowadays with, with digital marketing, because you can go in and you no longer need to guess. And, and Lee and myself were part of this with, with Neil nearly a year ago. And you can actually go in and you can create all the, um, the customer journeys. Okay, and you can map it all out. It's no longer guesswork. It's no longer putting an ad on the uh, radio and hoping you might or might not like, you know, get a few people to turn up. Okay, and you track it all out and then you consistently, remember a tinkering society? You consistently are tinkering. Okay, so we did all this work and then we don't use this tool effectively enough yet. But when we do, you know, it's so powerful because you go and do the customer journeys, you then pull up the reports you can look at project uh, summaries. Sorry, it's going to kick me out. It's, it's, I've got to log back in and, and then I'll, I'll show you it. But you know, this for me is so powerful because you're no longer guessing. It's, it's all about test, measure, predict, scale. And so you can go in, you can put down the customer journeys and, um, and let us just open up again. Then you can pull up the reports and you can go in, you'll see the project summaries. You can you see the, the investment. So we get asked by our shareholders, well, what happens if we pay a dividend this year? Okay, and I say, okay, well, what happens if we don't? And we reinvest any money we make into growing the platform. And where would that put the value? Well, it's no longer guesswork because you can actually see like what it will mean in terms of value for revenue, et cetera, et cetera. You can look at scenario comparisons, whether you invest 10% in marketing, 20%, 25%, and you can see what, what is happening in the growth space. And, um, and this is why it's so powerful. But really for me, what, what was so interesting is that Lee and I and, and a couple of our colleagues a year ago were out there and we were trying to like figure all this out and we we're trying to go on courses and, <laughs> and as fast as we learned. And then Neil actually helped us find someone that's called a performance marketer. And Aubrey joined our team at the end of last year in December last year and is now really starting to hit his stride. And he's had another colleague uh, join him recently called Gabby and they both came from Get Smarter and To You. I mean, these are hundred million dollar companies uh, in their, in their, um, in their revenue, not their valuations in their revenue. And so they bring those smarts with them. And what he's learned in 10 years, or more importantly, what he's forgotten in the last 10 years, Lee and I will probably never know. And so what we realized was stop trying to learn this stuff, just hire people that already get them on the team. And I'm so excited to have them part of the team. And then, you know, just to show you, and, and we don't have a lot of time tonight, but, but it's not only about investment, it's about community, it's about education, and it's about purpose. And we've built all these things out, the inner circle, the e-wealth pack, the investment test, it gives you an investment report. It tells you no matter where you are, what you should be focusing on. We've got micro degrees. We've got the wealth GPS. Um, we've got wealth consultants so that people can talk one-to-one. -one. You know, again, we're a, we're, a, we're a platform company with a human heart. You know, we've got starter packs because the, all this stuff's so overwhelming for people and it's got thousands of dollars worth of value, but people can get started from a, you know, $197. And this stuff became really material because that allowed us to go to our demand partners because they want to be able to make money on the front end. And that helped us really grow, whether it was money revealed, my wealth, you know, the wealth chef, et cetera. So you can see in terms of demand, there's multiple strategies on how to grow. And it's not just throwing money at Google. It's, 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 there's actually five independent strategies around how to roll out demand around the world. And then on the supply side, you know, you can deal with sponsors, you, you know, like Infinity or Orvest, or you can go and deal with entire platforms and, and you can provide them with a global experience. And you've kind of already seen that um, in terms of the platform. And then you've got the likes of companies like Zuzo that came along and they were like, listen, we, we want our own private white label. So we literally you know, went and created a white label for them and their deals were put on our platform, but only for their clients. And they had the deals, they had the clients and we just provided the infrastructure. And again, it's a great little business. 
um, and, and something that we're rolling out in the B2B space, you know, around, or, you know, around the world. And so it comes back to, you know, this, this whole concept of when we did the Cedars launch, not only did we raise capital, but more importantly, we, launch, we learned how to launch digitally. And there's actually a, a, a process, a formula to follow. So with our partners, we, we want to follow this formula when, when they go to a digital launch. Most property people or people in the financial industry have no idea how to launch. And more importantly, have never heard of how to digitally launch. And there's a formula they need to follow. And then lastly, the Rockefeller strategy. And this is where we roll out around the world. We learned the hard way in China. We made massive mistakes in China. But China's really started to grow now. And you can see the numbers and the momentum that China's getting. They've had a hard year this year with both COVID and, and the China-American wars. But, you know, we learn from that. And like in India, rather than trying to go everything on our own in India, property shares, a property platform, Sherios has... The last time we spoke to them, 15 million women. And these are the type of people that we want to partner with in terms of, you know, the whole women and wealth space. Now, what does that mean from a business perspective? Well, you know, Gavin Rousseau joined our team three years ago. It was three years ago this month. Now, he's a professional cyclist and SA champ. He worked for a company called Aprio that, that does trillions of dollars every year. And, and what was interesting to me was that I thought we were hiring a programmer, but actually what we got was a tech team builder. And he built us a book building system, him and his whole team. And I didn't really know what that was. And Lee, I don't know if you knew what it was, but I certainly didn't know what it was when he joined. Because I thought they were building a technology system to help our people invest in property. But actually what we built was a book building system, which allows us to do anything in the primary markets, property, private equity, structured notes, et cetera. And you know, he, why he joined us was his dreams to be able to invest in New York from $1,000. He started as our CTO and is now our COO. But in simple terms, what is a book building system? Well, you've got demand on the right, you've got supply on the left, you've got digital, you've got compliance, and you've got on operations. And all five of them are equally as important. You know, some people, when they say, I want to get a white label, and they think you can just go get a platform. Well, they're, they're completely wrong because it's about the demand, the supply, the compliance, and the operations. And a good example was when a company called uh, Cashbox came along, and they said, look, you know, we've got supply and we've got high net worth investors, but we need the rest. So we provided them with the rest of the solution. We provided them with the platform. We provided them with an alternative investment platform. And again, just to show you how easy and quick this is, I can literally go here. Now you watch me go into Wild Migrate just now. Watch me go into the alternative investment platform here. And um, we call this the Wealth Diversification Marketplace. And now when I log in, it's not only property projects. It's, um, it's private equity. It's the convertible debt. It's the structured notes. So it's all different alternative investment classes. And yet all the same functionality, all the same wallets, all the same money, all the same returns, um, all in one place. And um, I don't know about you guys, but you know, I find this extremely exciting. I can literally go along. I can say, right, I want to invest in this deal and I want to go into it. And I literally, so you watch me tonight invest in an American real estate deal. Now you're watching me go and literally invest in a structured note. And once again, it's done. And if I go back to my portfolio, you will see uh, now that I've got an investment in First Central Tower and an investment in Credit Suisse. Now, Lee, normally at this point when we, when we do this live, you know, people jump up and they scream and they shout and they go, Woohoo! This is flipping amazing! But, you know, after an hour and 43 minutes on a webinar, most people are falling asleep by now. Um, but but I, get, I get so excited at this point when, when, when I don't know if people truly understand how powerful this actually is. I think we did get Mandy out of her seat, jumping up and down in front of the screen. Um, she has posted, wow, that's amazing, Scott and team. Absolutely love it. So thank you, Mandy, for being our cheerleader tonight. We really do appreciate it. Awesome. And, um, and, and that's why I do live demos because, you know, there's nothing more powerful than showing you live. Anyone can do a PowerPoint presentation. So whether you, you know, I, I was with Neil for, for, for four nights, two weeks ago, and you're an educator, you know, whether you're an estate agent or a financial planner, whether you're a, 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 an asset manager or a family office, or even if you're an investment bank, we've literally got the solution for you. And if you look here, I mean, this was a wide label solution that we did for Investec. Um, we're still trying to go live with Investec. Though unfortunately, the lady we were working with um, resigned, which is always a bit tricky when, uh, when you're working with a big corporate. Um, and or even a platform, we can give them a solution. So 
it shows you that the, the scope now to scale is, is dramatic, basically. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to forget this diagram that we did six years ago, that the idea was always to start with high net worth investors, then to go to the mid market. So again, private wealth, wealth migrate, and one day it'll be wealth create, the naught to a thousand, but we're not there yet. Okay, so when we talk about it, we're going there, but we're not there yet. And um, our vision is to make investing as simple as, <laughs> to make our investing as simple as a swipe of a finger and ultimately to make it $1. And why do we say that? Because, because $1 won't change someone's life, but if you can change their habits, you can change their financial destiny. And if we do that, then we're living up to the wealth movement, which is to create a better and more sustainable planner for all. Do you know, when you look at it, the richest top 1% own more than 50% of the world's wealth and it's getting worse. And the reason being is because they invest in better assets. But the challenge is, is that they don't have access to those assets. Or the rest of us don't have access to those assets. Where you live in the world has a dramatic impact on your wealth. Whether you're a male or female has a dramatic impact on your wealth. And equally, if you're a millennial, it has a dramatic impact on your wealth in a negative way. And so the problem for us as investors in the property space, but actually it's in all assets, is that we're generally stuck in country. The barriers to entry are massive. And because of the ongoing complexity, you know, the legal, the banking, et cetera, the majority of us just don't do it. And therefore, when we say less than 1% of people retire wealthy, the problem is, is that the majority of people don't even have access to it. You know, 49% of the world's wealth is held in property and yet only 12.9% of the world's population has access to property. And of that 12.9%, you and me, less than 1% of us is going to retire wealthy. And the only way we're going to change that is if we empower the 99% to be able to invest like the top one percent and so this was a this was a social promise we made in 2015 and our manifesto was imagine a world a world where most or all people are literate a world where education is par for the course a world where women are treated as equals a world where all people have access to financial inclusion imagine a world where six billion people on the planet who currently live in poverty can live a better life imagine that world at the wealth movement we're aiming to create that world and that's the bigger picture purpose. And again, I come back to the thing of, you know, we spoke about the Amazon of global real estate. And for years, we spoke about the, the Amazon of global real estate. And then what we started to realize was that the last time there was a massive transfer of wealth, they called it the Big Bang. And the reason being is that to buy stocks in 1965, the average stock was on, a, on, the, on the stock market was held for six years. And then, you know, today it's 22 seconds. And the reason being is that a company came along called E-Trade in 1980. And today E-Trade is a $14 billion company. And now there's many, many more. You've got Easy Equities, you've got that investor I told you about, but that are making investment accessible to everybody. They democratized the stock market. They democratized not just where you lived in the world, but being able to invest anywhere in the world. And I'll ask you a question when it comes to property. The average home ownership at the moment is 8.7 years. And with platforms like Wealth Migrate and many others, how long do you think that's going to change? Do you think it's going to take 40 years for the world to change? I highly doubt it. And you know, this year, um, the IPO market in America is as busy as it was 20 years ago. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you could argue it's a bad thing. It's, it, we're in hype territory again. And therefore, you've got to be very careful. If you're, if you're investing at the IPO level, you might be too late. Maybe all the value has been taken off the table. But certainly it is in recognition of the patterns, the trends, and the fundamentals, and, and the whole change that the world is changing to, to this next paradigm. So we spoke about the Amazon of global real estate, but actually what we realized was that if you take the meta marketplace, where you've got a platform you know, in the middle, you've got global marketplaces, You've got local marketplaces, you've got real estate in the top left, you've got diversification in the top right, you've got genres, and you've got community. This is a meta marketplace, and it's all within the global wealth group. And ultimately, you know, it's actually not the Amazon of, of global real estate, it's the Amazon of personal wealth. You know, at the, at the center, at the core, it's all about a platform. And, you know, that platform is, 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 uh, is what we call WealthPoint. And, you know, whether it's Investec um, or even working with the likes of Offernet, because what Offernet allows us to do is get completely personalized. So if you take all that detail off that first slide, 
Now you've got Wealth Migrate. That's what we launched. Most of you know us from a Wealth Migrate perspective. We launched Wealth University. We launched the Wealth Movement. All of these exist. We launched a white label for Genius U. We launched a white label for Cashbox. We launched a white label for Guza. We launched a white label for the EDPF. We launched the Wealth Diversification Marketplace. All of this is live as we speak. Next, we're launching Private Wealth. We're launching Sapin. We, we hopefully are going to launch Investec. We're launching Calio. We want to launch Wealth SA. And with time, localized platforms in all areas. When we find the right partners, millennials and wealth. When we find the right woman group, woman and wealth. When we find the right Sharia compliant group, Sharia and wealth. But as an investor in the Global Wealth Group, you will own a piece of the entire meta marketplace. It's no longer about trying to pick one or the other. It's about, it's, 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 I heard a great metaphor. You know, wealth in the old days was like a pond and everyone had spoons and they were trying to take as much water out of the pond as they possibly could. Wealth today is like a river and each of us get to have a spoon. And all that we do by, by increasing the size of the river is, is change it from a little stream into the Amazon. And, uh, and with time, we will have wealth create. And so that's why we call it the Amazon of personal wealth. Now, I wanted to share with you, and I'm conscious of time, Lee. I knew this was going to be a, a, tight, uh, a tight rush. But, um, you know, this, this, is a, this is a concept that, that I learned from Roger uh, many, many years ago in 2014, where he got me to do the five-year plan. And if I go back to... I did have this open, but I see that it's closed. So let me just open it up again. So what they basically got us to do was to do an entire plan in, in a couple of days. So I went to Bali for four days and I actually went twice. I went in November and in December. And you have to basically come up with your enterprise promise, your team charter, um, your mission, your model, et cetera, your conditions of success. And you know, some of you have seen this before. Um, if I go to, sorry, I just need to close this down, open this up and I did have all this stuff open. And then before I started, I thought I better just, so our team charter again, for people that want to become potential investors, can we be happy to share this and you can literally see, um, you know, what the goals are, what the enterprise promises, the vision, the mission, who the avatars are, you know, what our values are, customer promise, the product range, supply demand, the network promise, the partner promise, the market promise, the investor promise, the systems promise, blah, 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 blah. You get the point. Five-year milestone, conditions of success, everything. So everything I talk about is actually here, um, including structures and, and what we're focusing on and how we're doing it. Okay? And I don't have time tonight to, to go through it, including you know, numbers and financials and focus. What's important, though, is that if I come back to Roger and, and the slideshow, is that they basically helped us create a five-year vision. And so we went out and we said, right, it was 2015. It was late 2014, early 2015. We said, where do we want to be by 2020? And we said, right, like, this is where we want to be by 2020. And, and, and to be honest, we didn't, you know, a lot of the stuff we dreamed about, we haven't created yet. Um, and when I look at them and what they dreamed about, then they're currently listing on the New York Stock Exchange for $300 million. And I think there's a huge amount to learn from this. And so I'm redoing this exercise at the moment. And Lee doesn't even know about this yet but I am I'm about to engage with the team because I've actually gone and redone the five years and um, what it looks like and where we want to be in the next five years. Now, this is not finalized yet and it's not to be shared with the team yet. Uh, sorry, to be shared with investors yet because as a team, we haven't finalized this. I've given it my first shot. Um, and over the next 60 days, we as a team are going to be finalizing this. But I'm a very big believer in making sure that you're your five-year vision is clear and then breaking it down year by year with your key milestones. Now, let's be clear. If you say you know what you're going to do in five years, you're dreaming. Um, but what you can do is have clear milestones to be able to target. And, and that's why what I think is so important is what's the vision for the company over the next five years? So the play on words, Wealth 5.0, where are we going over the next five years? And then even individually, what about Lee 5.0? Where does Lee want to be in the next five years? Where does Scott want to be in the next five years? Because if you marry together individuals flow, community flow with team flow, <clears throat> then you get real success. When you look at our team, probably the thing I'm most excited about about the future is the team we've built. 
you know, Lee, we've got an absolutely awesome leadership team now with a balance between digital property tech, but most importantly, that's the new age, new power thinkers. You know, something I struggled with a lot over the last five, six years was getting the right team balance. And I'd love Lee just for you to share um, even your own experiences over the last couple of weeks, even with the likes of Gabby joining us and stuff. Um, what, what are your thoughts on where, where this team can go over the next five years in terms of the ability to work together, to understand social dynamics, the balancing of feminine, masculine energy, you know, different cultures, you know, et cetera, et cetera. What, what are your, what's your take on the team? Because, you know, at the end of the day, you back an idea, but more importantly, you back a team. No, Scott, I think uh, the team that we've got at the moment is at a point where we are all very excited. We all seem to be on the same page, um, which is amazing. And with Gabby joining, it definitely has added a different dynamic. We've been saying for a long time that we want some more female energy. Um, for, and she definitely has brought that. Along with that, she has got some amazing ideas um, on team, on community on our investors um, and all the wealth of knowledge that she has brought from Get Smarter with her um, on how we can do things better, not necessarily faster, but definitely smarter and add more value. And so we're very excited. Along with that, we've got a new energy in the team um, just by where we have decided we need to go as a company. And it's really amazing to see how even at the end of the year when most people are quite tired and are sitting there thinking, when are the holidays coming, that we are energized and really looking forward to what we can get out of the stables by December before we all go and leave. No, I agree with you, Lee. And I think also just pointing out Willem, you know, I've known Willem for, he's been part of a number of these webinars and we finally got him on board as an official advisor and everything, which is really exciting to us as well. We've been doing a lot of work with him over the next couple of weeks and months. Um, just in terms of some documentation, you know, if you're interested in our financial reports, we can share them with you. If you're interested in a fact sheet, you know, for those that don't like to read 70 page reports, you can read the three or four page fact sheet. Um, all the information's there. You know, our three core values are trust, transparency, and alignment. In simple terms, what's our business trying to do? It's number of transactions, it's average fees, and it's average transaction size. So whether you talk about wealth migrate, the private wealth group, um, you know, wealth create, woman and wealth, it doesn't matter. At an overall global wealth group perspective, we're aiming for $100 million in revenue, which puts us at a billion dollar valuation. That means we need more transactions. We need to lower the transaction size. And in one calendar year, we want to do a million transactions at an average of 5% with an average of $2,000 per transaction, which is 100 million in revenue and a billion dollar valuation. So across the meta marketplace, that is the goal. And what we've realized is rather than trying to do it all in one place and be everything to everyone, it's better to chunk it down and to get that niche focus. And again, these are, these are just some of the, the ideas. Question we get asked all the time, what about you know, liquidity? We're going through an interesting process at the moment, uh, Ken and I specifically, we're gonna spend a week at the end of October working with Willem uh, specifically around what is, where do we really wanna be? You know, Roger's listing on the New York Stock Exchange right now and that's really opened my own eyes to this whole concept of where the world's going and getting very clear on what we're going to do and then working backwards. And then lastly, you know, we talk a lot about our wealth partners and, we, and really we copied Salesforce. You know, back in 99, they went to the venture capitalists. They couldn't get capital because people said that people will never put their information in the cloud. So they said, well, we'll go to people who are already using it. They know it, they like it, they understand it. And they, they allowed people to, to invest. Uh, today, they're the 14th biggest technology company in the world. They're worth $50 billion or something. And we really copied that. And that's where we created our wealth collaborative economy. And what I would highly recommend, there's six different parts to our wealth collaborative economy. It's empowered people co-creating a better world you know, for all. And I always say to people, there's only three reasons why you would become a shareholder of this company. And if all three don't resonate with you, then do not become a shareholder. One is you want to make a profit. You want to 5x to 10x your capital over the next five to seven years. Two is you want to be part of a global community. You want to learn, grow, and invest together. You want to become a global citizen. And three is you want to have a purposeful impact on the planet. And if you don't resonate with all three of those, then, then please don't become a shareholder because you won't, you won't be in flow with the rest of the global ecosystem. And there's a video here, which I know we're running late tonight, so I'm not going to play the whole thing. But we asked our different shareholders over the years to, to give us one word 
to describe what it was like to be part of the wild partner community. And I'll play 10 or 20 seconds and then, Inspired. you know, Lee can put the, the whole video out there. Credibility. Enlightened. Impactful. Unimaginable. Peace of mind. Anyway, I, that goes on for about three minutes. And if we, I mean, we did that when we had 140 shareholders. If we did it when we now got 100, 863, it would go on for about 20 minutes. But, uh, but the exciting thing is we've got shareholders, you know, this amazing community of people from 42 countries around the world. And like I showed you before, you can wait and get involved in an IPO or you can get involved, you know, much higher up the value chain in terms of um, the, the growth side. And, uh, and that's really what we, what we enabled people with, um, with CEDARS. And, and you can go and check it all out because as I said to you, they are an authorized entity. So what is the, what is the opportunity? And, and, and for those of you, this is the theory part that's finishing. Now I'm mo moving to the practical part. You know, what is the opportunity? Well, we basically are copying Amazon. 20 years ago, Amazon created a convertible debt when everyone, when you had the, the dot-com boom bust and everyone was going bankrupt, Amazon did a convertible debt. They raised a lot of capital that allowed them to invest in innovation and allowed them to invest in their platform business and it allowed them to have marketplace rollout to, to grow market share. We're doing exactly the same thing. We're giving an opportunity for people to invest in the group via a convertible loan, offering seven to 10% uh, for five years. And again, remember that's paid every year um, with, a, with an opportunity to convert into Wild Migrate shares. To be clear, the Wild Migrate Limited, which is the UK holding company, is gonna be rebranded the Global Wealth Group. So that's why I always talk about the Global Wealth Group. Um, we're raising $5 million, of which $2 million is debt, $3 million is equity for strategic acquisitions and commercial acceleration of our business within an ecosystem. We're looking to 10x our current metrics, increase our valuation dramatically on the path to at least 100 million plus RPO. The returns are based on the size of the investment. The interest is paid quarterly and it's secured against the group real estate assets. So the group real estate assets are plus minus $4 million. Um, the reason we are doing the debt only to $2 million is that it gives you 200% cover. Now, if you wanna sit here and say, well, we've had COVID and the real estate assets have gone to 3 million, that's exactly why we made it 2 million so that we didn't have to have a debate about what the value was. The, the, the capital was protected by the real estate assets. Uh, with the looming repercussions of COVID-19, so all the big things that are changing around the world that I've already shared with you, we provide the infrastructure for local and global entrepreneurs and institutions who want to specifically target client bases in niche markets. And by doing that, we exponentially grow the meta marketplace. So rather than thinking in a linear way, it's like, Lee, how can you and me grow Wealth Migrate? We're thinking in an exponential way. How can we 10X this? How can we bring on multiple marketplaces? And that's why it's a meta marketplace. It's really the concept of being a venture builder. And I'll talk a lot more about this in the webinar on the 4th of November. It's about bringing on fintech entrepreneurs and expanding the business within the ecosystem and ultimately helping them with the tools and the strategy and the marketing of the global group, but also bringing their individual expertise and their local knowledge and, and ultimately creating an incubation hub for marketplaces. And finally, you know, our aim is to, to have an IPO listing of minimum of 100 million. As I said to you, Roger's doing his at the moment at 300 million on the New York Stock Exchange, which is really interesting. Ken and I have always been talking about the London Stock Exchange and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, then to continue growing to 500 million and a billion within at least the seven years. And um, when one looks at it, all the acquisition targets or the strategic partnerships, we want to dramatically add value to them by plugging them in with the worldwide wealth and equally significantly increase their value through revenue and profitability. It's win-win. And what's the opportunity? Well, we've got three different levels. We've got a silver level, which is $25,000. It's a 7% interest rate paid per year. It's a 3% discount off the current share price. We've got a gold level, which is $100,000. It's an 8% interest and a 7% discount. And we've got a platinum level, which is $250,000. It's a 10% interest. And it's a class A shares, which are the, the, the preferred shares and a 12% discount. And then just some final notes is that it converts in five years. So imagine being able to lock in the price of Amazon shares now, but only pay for them in five years. Um, we are keeping a capital in the bank to make sure that the interest payments can be paid. The capital is actually protected against the real estate assets. And what's interesting, and this is actually wrong, Lee, I need to update this. Um, we've got about 730, I think, in the bank. It might actually be over that now, 750 in the bank. 
Um, we've got about, it was four or 500, because obviously as the money comes in the bank, the contracts, whatever, um, um, you know, in contracts, and we've got another 1.1 in warm commitments um, and, and, and people that are actually really keen. And then on top of that, on the equity side, we've got a contract signed for $3.25 million on the equity side. And we're just find, trying to finalize the timing. So if people are interested, there's been quite a lot of demand. Um, and, and we look at the close the site before the end of the year. What are we going to invest the capital in? Well, 48% is going to go into the, into the platform and creating multiple agile teams. 24% uh, is going to go into the digital products, branding and marketing. 18% uh, is going to go into marketplace rollout and human capacity. And 10% is going to go into compliance and corporate governance. So just by the way, we had that in there before I learned what an ESG was, <laughs> corporate governance. Anyway, and, um, and then really, yeah, next steps. You can go to the landing page um, where literally you can, there's a video there. You can um, download that uh, fact sheet um, and you can speak with one of our wealth consultants. Um, I'd highly recommend speaking to a wealth consultant and understanding um, what it's about. You can go directly to the platform if you are, you know, if you believe in where the world's going and you want to just do it yourself, you can literally go on the platform and, um, and or you can, uh, you can WhatsApp Lee. And so Lee, what I'd like to do quickly is if we could put the poll up again around, um, I am conscious of, of the time and I do know I've gone over my two hours, but um, just so that we can see if people are interested, you know, we've spoken a lot tonight about personalization. And for me, it's really interesting. You know, we've had hundreds of people on this webinar um, tonight and, and over the years as it's evolved and adapted. And the more people tell us what they want, the more we can try and personalize their journey between our team, yourself as head of community, the guys that are running the, 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 the data team and the wealth consultants, it all helps us to personalize the journey. And so, you know, my real request for people is please vote, you know, and if, if you're not interested, so be it as well. You know, it's, um, it just helps us really personalize what what you're looking for and and what you're interested in and the more you tell us what you're interested in the more we can help um find you those solutions so i'll leave this on the screen does anyone have any questions so i, I see lee you were answering a couple of questions there in the chat box and i'd love to know if anyone's got any questions i know that tonight and every time i do this webinar it's not like drinking from a from a tap it's like drinking from a fire hose it's a hell of a lot of information and i really do struggle to condense it you know down because it's 20 years of knowledge that you're trying to bring it all together. Um, and maybe it's time to turn it into a half day workshop, but that's a separate conversation. <laughs> any questions from anyone or Lee, any questions that have come up that I missed? I'm just having a look here. I think most of them have been answered, Scott. So I'm just scrolling through here to make sure that we've got them. No, I think we've answered all the questions that have come through this. Um, Basil has come through and said uh, that he does have a few questions after this, but he's going to go straight to Alex. Alex is one of our wealth, con uh, our wealth um, consultants. So, um, yes, please do reach out to Alex. And um, if he cannot help you, then please reach out to me and we'll make sure that your questions do get answered. Good. Okay. Well, I um, we can leave the poll open. I'm going to just uh, bring up, uh, this is a link if you're interested in the exponential test that Willem has been sharing uh, with people. And equally, you know, we've got a couple more webinars coming up. Uh, the one is the Changing World Order, um, where we'll be reviewing everything Ray Dalio has been saying. Then we've got Prof Rudy talking about the impact of property and, and this whole space I've spoken about. We've then got uh, Society 5.0, Entrepreneur, Investor, Wealth 5.0, you know, what does one focus on and, and, and everything with regards to that. And then actually to round it all off in November, we've got a panel with David Orban and Willem and myself taking all the concepts we've spoken about and allowing people to turn up and actually ask questions and, and really be able to interrogate and to find out, you know, the information that, that, that you want. So in conclusion, you know, for me, the definition of luck is when preparation meets opportunity. I personally have spent 20 years uh, preparing for this global shift. And um, as a team, the Wealth My Great team has spent 10 years now. And um, I'm super excited for what the team has created, the team we've got together, the community we've got together, and all these 
trends, patterns, and fundamentals are now converging to provide a generational opportunity. And why do I believe this is possible? Well, because if you take the eight technology trends, you take the eight societal trends, you know, with or without us, they, they're intersecting. And in the next decade, it's why it's going to create one of the most exciting decades in human history. And you can either watch what's happening, you can either ignore what's happening, or you can either participate in what's happening. And like I told you about the gentleman from Apple, you know, back in 1976, maybe one day you'll remember back to a little webinar like this and go, sure, I wish I'd uh, got involved or taken action. And then why, to remind everyone, there's five, three reasons why people become wealth partners. The first is profit. Uh, the second is they want to be part of a global community where they can learn, grow, and invest with like-minded people. I never realized how powerful this was, to be honest, until I was part of it. And then thirdly, they want to be purposeful. They, they want to solve one of the greatest challenges on the planet and empower the 99% to be able to invest like the top 1% using technology and smart investing. You know, we've decided to go after the greatest problem on the planet, which is the wealth gap. And therefore, we believe it's the biggest opportunity. And I want to finish with a story. You know, this is a young man that back in 2015, we were running Lemonade Day, which was empowering children with entrepreneurship education. And, um, you know, he, his mom was a, well, his mom is a police lady and his dad is a security guard who's no longer there. And he, he had a dream, like, and he was so persistent running his Lemonade Day stand. And he had a dream that he wanted to go to a private school. Well, he's now in, um, he's in high school this year, uh, not just high school, he's in um, a trick. He's on his way to university next year. And, um, and it's so interesting. He's captain of the hockey club and he's played provincial uh, sports and he's, you know, loved by his peers and he's a leader and everything else. And, you know, I tend to say, you know, this is, this is, you know, this could be another Elon Musk. And when I look at what we're doing here and, and the bigger picture purpose, you know, you don't empower a billion people. You empower one person at a time. You change one person's life. And if nothing else tonight, what we've tried to do is inspire you and add value to you um, so that we can change your life. Because if we can change one person's life, then they will help change other people's lives. And, if, and, and over time, it's the butterfly effect. We will, we will empower a billion people. And so in conclusion, you know, this is my son at a very young age. He was sort of five years old. He was playing, you know, Monopoly. And he learned that to earn, you know, greenhouses and red hotels and earn a passive income is what we call a smart investing. You know, his dad with an incredible team has, has joined the, you know, the, the, the childhood fantasy of playing Monopoly into a reality and now has a diversified portfolio across four continents, both residential and commercial. It's what we call smart investing. You know, the wealthiest people in the world, they focus on generational wealth, uh, not just being wealthy themselves, but, you know, wealth for many generations to come. It's what we call smart investing. And for us, we want to put smart investing in every single person's pocket. And we invite you on the journey. You know, tonight we've hopefully shared some information that has enlightened you on where the world is and where it's going. We've invited you on a journey. And, and if, there's a, if there's a fit, then we would welcome you to talk to us. It's not for everyone. It's by invite only. And um, because we really want to only have a like-minded, a group of like-minded individuals that want to change the world, that want to be profitable, that also want to be purposeful. And Lee, with uh, well over my time, uh, that's all from me. Scott, thank you very much for another powerful webinar. We do appreciate the energy and the time that you put into it. And every time you do add more and give more, as you can see by the comments that are coming in. So to all our attendees as well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I know that we are two and a quarter hours into the webinar, but it really has been an amazing share and we appreciate your time. As Scott mentioned a little bit earlier, our next webinar is on the 13th of October. It is Scott's analysis of Ray Dalio's The Changing World Order and where Ray Dalio sees the world going. So please do join us for that. We will be sending out email invitations, but I have posted the link in the chat if you want to sign up to that webinar. It's the same time, 5 p.m. GMT, 6 p.m. UK and 7 p.m. South Africa. So we look forward to seeing you on that. So wherever you are in the world, I hope oh, that just, you... Lee, just before you, you, you log off, uh, one thing there is that if people have found value in this webinar or previous webinars, 
you know, please share the links with your friends and family and or invite them to the future webinars. You know, I find with COVID, everyone's very tired and quite frankly, feeling quite down. And, um, you know, I like the metaphor of where the American presidents talk about 100 days and what they can do in 100 days. And we basically got 100 days till the end of this year. And um, hopefully these webinars can be used as a catalyst to inspire people to what's possible and why the future is so exciting. And so please, if you get value out of these, please share them with others. You know, let, let's inspire and empower many, many more people. And on top of that, if there's anything we can do to improve, please let us know. You know, we, we, we always ears as to how we can add more value. Absolutely. And um, on the back of that as well, if there are any topics that you think we should be covering in future webinars or you'd like us to investigate and present, please do let us know as well. You've got my email address. You've got Scott's email address. Please feel free to reach out. We will take any of that on board. So wherever you are in the world, I hope that you are surrounded by love and by people who enjoy your company and inspire you. Take care, be safe and be blessed. Until next time. Good night. Good night, everyone.